R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 3, Chapters 8 through 11. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 8, It Is All My Fault. A light haze obscured the scudding clouds and dimmed the pale stars in the early morning of July 3, but the thermometer gave warning of another torrid day, and a roaring cannonade swept over the ridges to tell that Ewell, in obedience to orders, was preparing to attack. Less delay again occurred to prevent coordination of the assault, Lee rode immediately to the headquarters of the 1st Corps, far down on the right. On the way he saw nothing of Pickett's division, which he had ordered up from its bivouac on the Chambersburg Road. Neither did he observe any evidence of preparations for the offensive. When he reached the ground where Longstreet had spent the night, he discovered the reason. General, Longstreet began, I have had my scouts out all night, and I find that you still have an excellent opportunity to move around to the right of Meade's army and maneuver him into attacking us. In fact, Longstreet had already directed his troops to start to the right, despite Lee's orders for a renewal of the assault on Meade's position. Weary as Lee must have been of Longstreet's endless contention for the acceptance of his own plan, he listened patiently, and then, once again, told Longstreet that he intended to attack the Federal Army where it stood with the three divisions of the First Corps, Hoods, McClauses, and Pickets. But Longstreet was not to be silenced. He argued that he had been a soldier all his life, and that he did not believe any 15,000 men could be found who would be capable of storming the ridge. More than that, he insisted that he could not deliver the assault with his full corps. Hood and McClaws, he said, were facing superior forces. They could not attack where they were, he maintained, and if they were withdrawn and employed against Cemetery Ridge, the Federals would pour down from Round Top and get on the flank and in the rear of his corps. His argument was warm and lengthy. Lee believed that his plan was practicable and that a general assault along the right held out the highest promise of success. His army had never yet failed to carry a federal position when he had been able to throw his full strength against it. Only when his assault had been delivered with part of his forces, as at Malvern Hill, had he ever failed. But now, in the face of Longstreet's continued opposition, he probably reasoned that if Longstreet did not have faith in the plan it would be worse than dangerous to entrust the assault to his troops alone. Lack of confidence is half of defeat. So, as happened only too often, Lee put aside what he regarded as the best plan and, out of consideration for a subordinate, improvised a second best. He would leave Hood and McClaws where they were and would shift the front of the attack more to the center. For McClaws's division he would substitute hates of A.P. Hill's corps, and in place of Hood he would use two brigades of Pender's division to cooperate with Longstreet's fresh division under Pickett. This would give Longstreet substantially the same effective strength as if he attacked with the whole of the First Corps. It seemed a reasonable thing to do in the circumstances, but, as the event proved, the shift of the attack to the right center subjected the assaulting column to a fire on both flanks. This arrangement called for the movement of the two brigades of Pender three-quarters of a mile to the right, and as that would take time, Ewell was notified that Longstreet's attack would be delayed until 10 a.m. To make it certain that Pender's brigades should have experienced leadership in the assault, Lee directed that General Trimble be summoned from the left and put in charge of them. The change of plan did not satisfy Longstreet, whose chosen maxim of maneuvering to compel the enemy to attack was violated by Lee's aggressiveness. Never was I so depressed, Longstreet subsequently confessed, as upon that day. He argued that the guns from Little Round Top would enfilade his line, and, though he finally subsided, he was not wholly reassured when told by Colonel Long, whose judgment of artillery was usually excellent, that the fire of these guns could be suppressed. When the discussion was over, Lee rode with Longstreet back toward the center to study the ground more closely and to see that the artillery was well posted for its indispensable part in the attack. Longstreet remained listless and despairing. Even the men in the ranks observed that he kept his eyes on the ground and had gloom written on his countenance. Despite his dark humor, however, Longstreet had made one wise decision. He had entrusted the placing of his corps of artillery to one of his battalion commanders, Colonel E. P. Alexander, perhaps the best artillerist in the Army of Northern Virginia.
Alexander had advanced 75 of the 83 guns of Longstreet's corps to good ground along the Emmitsburg Road, from the Peach Orchard northward for about 1,300 yards. All these pieces were in advance of the infantry positions, and some of them, on Longstreet's left, were within 650 yards of the enemy. Five guns of Pogue's battalion of Hill's corps were also in advance. The other pieces, however, were under cover along Seminary Ridge, and a full battalion was in rear, unable to find position. Even those on the ridge were at a distance of 1,400 yards from the enemy. Very little was done to produce a converging fire or to blanket the Federal guns on Cemetery Hill. Altogether, about 125 guns would be available to protect the attack of the infantry. As Lee passed among them, the artillerists were at ease, waiting for the struggle they knew was coming. Some of their officers slipped out where they could see the enemy's lines and could speculate on the ranges and on the prospects of the battle. Seeing Major James Deering on the ridge within range of the enemy, Lee sent word to him to retire. I do not approve of young officers needlessly exposing themselves, he said, their places with their batteries. Then he rode on. His face was anxious and careworn, but his manner was as self-possessed as if he were back at Culpeper, watching Stuart's troopers in the sham battle with their own horse artillery. Tomorrow might see the army's banners in victorious pursuit of Meade's shattered divisions on the road to Baltimore, or, if the charge failed, the next day's sun might find the defeated army of Northern Virginia struggling back to the mountains, a triumphant enemy at its heels. Yet Lee did not believe it would be so. He had to consider the alternative, of course, but despite Longstreet's misgivings, he had unlimited confidence in the prowess of the army. Where Wright had gone the day before, with little artillery support, he was confident three divisions could go now, and could stay. Nor was he shaken by the concern of some of the officers. When he met General Wofford, that officer proudly told him that he had nearly reached the crest of the ridge the previous afternoon. Lee asked him if he could not go there again. No, General, said Wofford, I think not. Why not? Lee inquired. Because, General, the enemy have had all night to entrench and reinforce. I had been pursuing a broken enemy, and the situation now is very different. Lee was determined that nothing should be lacking in infantry preparation. Twice he rode the whole length of the line with Longstreet and then went over it again without him. When at last he was satisfied, the morning hours were gone, the sun was high, and the heat was burning. From the sky the last cloud had been driven. On the left, unknown to Lee, Johnson had been assailed and had begun a counteroffensive before Ewell had received Lee's notice that Longstreet would not attack until 10 a.m. Johnson was wearing himself out and would be unable to cooperate when the great assault was launched. Coordination had failed again. The two brigades of Pender's division were now in rear of Spangler's Wood, Pickett's division had silently moved up and was in position west of the Emmitsburg Road, behind Alexander's guns. In front of Haight's division, almost midway between the armies, the skirmishers were carrying on a sharp struggle, and Hill's artillery was wasting much of its scanty ammunition. This fire died away shortly after noon, however, and silence fell over the field. The only omen of what was about to come was a twin beacon of flame where the skirmishers had been engaged, a wooden dwelling house and a large barn ignited by the Federals because they were in the line of fire. While these buildings were burning, Lee rode out in front of the right of Pettigrew's command with Longstreet and with Hill to arrange the last tactical details. Beneath them, Seminary Ridge fell away unevenly and then rose again to the Emmitsburg Road. On the right of the front of assault the road was 300 yards from the ridge. Between the highway and the enemy's position there was a little swale that afforded some shelter. But on the center and left the road was only 135 yards from the ridge, and the ground rose almost directly, without cover. The objective that Lee chose for the coming assault was a small grove of umbrella-shaped chestnut oaks, known locally as Ziegler's Grove, but described by the Confederates simply as the little clump of trees. A close examination of this ground through strong glasses showed that a post and rail fence ran south to north along Cemetery Ridge and that in rear of the stones cleared from the ridge had been piled up in a crude wall about two and a half to three feet high. This stone wall turned east at a right angle and ran in that direction for 80 yards before it turned north again. Within this angle, the stone fence was about two feet higher than on the south and north stretch below.
the intervening fields between Seminary Ridge and the Stonewall were crossed and recrossed with fences, and the Emmitsburg Road was bordered on either side by a stout barrier of plank and posts. Narrow the objective was, compared with the front of attack. The lines therefore would have to converge. How could this best be assured? Pickett's was to be the right division in the attack, with Kemper's brigade on the right in the first line and Garnett's on the left. Armistead was to be in support. Haight's division, under Pettigrew, was to form on Pickett's left, its four brigades from right to left being, in order, Archers, under Colonel B. D. Fry, Pettigrew's old brigade under Colonel J. K. Marshall, Davis's and Mayo's, Brockenbrough's. The two brigades of Pender's division under Trimble were to be in support of Haight, Scales is on the right, led by Colonel W. L. J. Lawrence, and Lane's on the left. On the extreme right, in rear of Pickett's right flank, Wilcox was to be placed to meet any counterattack against the flank. The line, then, was to be as follows. Mayo Davis Marshall Fry Garnett Kemper Lane Lawrence Armistead Wilcox Fry's was thus the center brigade and its direction would be straight ahead. Pickett's division and the three left brigades of Pettigrew were directed to dress on Fry as soon as they were in the open. The distance that Pettigrew would have to cover was considerably greater than that of Pickett if measured from their respective positions to the ridge, but as Pickett's right would have to swing much farther to the left than Pettigrew's left would have to move to the right, the two divisions were expected to reach their objective at the same time. The artillery was to cover the charge by a concentrated bombardment of the enemy's position. The infantry were not to start until the artillery fire had done its fullest execution and had silenced the enemy's batteries, if this was possible. Meantime, the columns of assault were to be kept under cover and were not to be shown the field over which they were to charge, but the officers were to go to the crest, examine the ground, and prepare the men for what awaited them. Longstreet was to be in general command, with authority to call on Hill for Anderson's division if he required it. Hill was anxious to employ his whole corps in the charge, and besought Lee to permit him to do so, but the general refused. What remains of your corps, he said, caution blending with confidence, will be my only reserve, and it will be needed if General Longstreet's attack should fail. The orders must stand. When everything was ready, Longstreet was to have two cannon fired in quick succession as a signal for the bombardment to open. To him, also, was given the responsibility of deciding at what moment the infantry should start and when the batteries should limber up and follow. Was the plan understood? It was. Had aught been omitted in preparation? Neither Hill nor Longstreet knew of anything, at least Longstreet did not think to tell Lee that he had not inquired whether the artillery still had enough ammunition for a long cannonade. Lee folded up his map, the three rose from the fallen log where they had seated themselves, and, mounting once again, they rode each to his station. The commanding general was still confident, Hill was alert but had none of the immediate responsibility of the assault on him, Longstreet was close to black dismay. He knew, Longstreet subsequently said of Lee, that I did not believe that success was possible, that care and time should be taken to give the troops the benefit of positions and the grounds, and he should have put an officer in charge who had more confidence in his plan. But of this, he said nothing to Lee. For the supreme effort of all his warring, Lee had to act through a sullen, despairing lieutenant. There was a momentary flurry as a troop of federal cavalry rode into the rear of Hood's division, but this was quickly over. A battery of horse artillery was put into the Emmitsburg Pike to protect the flank against further incursions by mounted troops, and the last preparations were complete. The time had come to give the order for the bombardment. Longstreet could not bring himself to do it. Instead, he wrote Colonel Alexander, if the artillery fire does not have the effect to drive off the enemy or greatly demoralize him, so as to make our effort pretty certain, I would prefer that you should not advise Pickett to make the charge. I shall rely a great deal upon your judgment to determine the matter and shall expect you to let General Pickett know when the moment offers. Then Longstreet went off in the woods and lay down, to think of some method of assisting in the attack, as he affirmed, but as Colonel Fremantle thought, to go to sleep. Alexander was of the bravest of the brave, but he was unprepared to assume the responsibility he felt his chief was trying to unload on him. As soon as he received Longstreet's note, he replied, in substance. 
I will only be able to judge of the effect of our fire on the enemy by his return fire, as his infantry is little exposed to view and the smoke will obscure the field. If, as I infer from your note, there is any alternative to this attack, it should be carefully considered before opening our fire, for it will take all the artillery ammunition we have left to test this one, and if result is unfavorable we will have none left for another effort. And even if this is entirely successful, it can only be so at a very bloody cost. Aroused to receive this message, Longstreet drafted an answer as follows. Colonel, the intention is to advance the infantry if the artillery has the desired effect of driving the enemies off or having other effects such as to warrant us in making the attack. When that moment arrives, advise General Pickett and of course advance such artillery as you can use in aiding the attack. This paper reached Alexander at a time when General A. R. Wright was with him. What do you think of it? He asked Wright. The trouble is not in going there, his fellow Georgian answered. I was there with my brigade yesterday. There is a place where you can get breath and reform. The trouble is to stay there after you get there, for the whole Yankee army is there in a bunch. Alexander sought out Pickett, who was calm and confident, and then sent back this brief note to Longstreet. General, when our fire is at its best, I will advise General Pickett to advance. The silence on the field was now almost complete. Directly opposite the Confederate line a little group of Federal officers were sitting about on the ground, after a late breakfast, smoking and wondering whether Meade had been correct when he had said early in the morning that if Lee attacked at all that day it would be against the center, because he had tried on both flanks and had failed. The Federal infantry were huddled behind the stone wall that ran along the ridge, or were blistering in the tall grass in front of the wall, where the first line had been formed. The Southern infantry were idling under cover. They had ceased their usual banter, because the rumor had spread among them that they were to be called to charge over the rim of the hill that cut off their view of the federal position, but in the memory of old triumphs, they were as confident as ever they had been. All Pickett's fifteen regiments were Virginians, some of them among the earliest volunteers. They were fresh and had done no severe fighting since Sharpsburg. Trimble's ten regiments, Pender's former command, were from North Carolina, as good troops as that state had sent to the front. Two of Pettigrew's brigades were of A.P. Hill's famous Old Light Division, Virginians, Tennesseans, and Alabamians, but both these units were small and both were under colonels. One of them, Mayo's, was in bad condition. Pettigrew's two remaining brigades were Davis's Mississippians and his own North Carolinians. They were new to the Army of Northern Virginia, but they had caught the contagion of its morale. Wilcox's old brigade of five Alabama regiments had been tested on many a field. Thus, in the 47 regiments of the column of attack, about 15,000 men, there were to be 19 regiments from Virginia, 14 from North Carolina, 7 from Alabama, 4 from Mississippi, and 3 from Tennessee. If Perry were employed in support, three Florida regiments would be added, if Perrin were called in, he would lead the five South Carolina regiments that had been McGowan's and previously Gregg's famous brigade and if right were needed, his Georgians would be ready again. Every southern state east of the Mississippi was, or might be, represented in the assault, the Army of Northern Virginia at its best, a cross-section of the Confederacy, city dwellers and the sons of great planters, men from the tidal waters and from the hungry mountains, scholars and illiterates, the inheritors of historic names and the unrenowned sons of the poor. Hungry, athirst, dirty, they waited under the noonday sun whose fiery course was to decide whether America would be two nations. On a clock in the stately house in Richmond where Davis, sick and anxious, looked up expectantly for a telegram from Lee whenever a knock came at his door, noon along the Mississippi, as Pemberton with heavy heart was penning a letter asking terms of General Grant for the surrender of Vicksburg, tea time in London, and a sealed letter on the desk of John Bigelow telling Secretary Seward he was satisfied that Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania had been made in concert with J. I. Roebuck's proposal. In the House of Commons that Her Majesty's government enter into negotiations with foreign powers for the recognition of the Confederacy. Almost on the hour, the silence of the fields around Gettysburg was broken by a gun on the Emmitsburg Road. Before men had time to shape the question that rose in every mind, the echo of another cannon swelled from the same position. It was the agreed signal for the opening of the bombardment. Instantly the gunners all along the line sprang to their loaded pieces, and in another moment the roar of the massed batteries shook the ridge.
orders were to fire in salvos, and as the guns were discharged together, the concussion told of a coming terror that would make them long for the lesser dangers of Gaines's mill and of Sharpsburg. Two or three miles away, waiting teamsters heard the windows rattle as if assailed by a sudden storm. The firing was a little high for the stone wall behind which the Federal infantry were huddled, but as the exploding shells struck the ridge they hurled the earth into the air and shattered rocks that flew in fragments as deadly as the iron itself. Soon the Federal batteries opened, 18 guns from the very grove picket was to charge, and up and down a line that lengthened until a front of fully two miles was blazing in answer. On their high trajectory, round shells could be plainly seen for the whole of their flight, but the rifled shell were visible only when they tumbled. Soon the smoke and the dust obscured the target and darkened the sun. Save for the odor and the long, sulfurous strata above the denser clouds, the scene resembled the center of some furious thunderstorm. Now the Confederate shell found a caisson, and as its contents exploded with a roar and a flash of flame, the artillerists raised a yell that was plainly heard by the Federals. Now, in return, a Union missile struck in the waiting ranks of the infantry, and the stretcher-bearers rushed in to carry out the wounded, the men who never saw the other side of the hill. Twenty minutes of this maddening bombardment, and the ammunition of some of the Confederate batteries was half gone, with no diminution in the Federal fire. Alexander felt, by this time, that there was little hope of silencing the enemy's fire, and he reasoned that unless the infantry moved soon, the artillery would not be able to cover its advance. He scratched off this note to pick it. General, if you are to advance at all, you must come at once or we will not be able to support you as we ought. But the enemy's fire has not slackened materially and there are still 18 guns firing from the cemetery. Behind Alexander's position, between the artillery and in the infantry, Longstreet rode at a walk, looking neither to right nor to left. In front of Armistead's and Garnett's brigades, the chaplains came out and, kneeling, offered prayers amid a knot of bare-headed boys. This is a desperate thing to attempt, Garnett said to Armistead. It is, stout-hearted old Armistead answered, but the issue is with the Almighty, and we must leave it in his hands. Presently, after a shell had hit a nearby tree, Armistead calmly pulled off a splinter and exhibited it to the men. Boys, said he, do you think you can go up under that? It is pretty hot out there. There was a confident answer, but presently, when a rabbit sprang from the bushes and leaped rapidly toward the rear, a gaunt Virginian voiced the feelings of thousands when he cried, Run, Olhar, if I was an Olhar, I would run, too. The wounded were more numerous, a fragment of a bursting shell had struck down Colonel W. R. Aylett of the 54th Virginia. It was harder waiting under that fire than it would be in making the assault. Suddenly, through a rift in the smoke, Alexander saw Federal batteries withdrawing from the vicinity of the little grove. At the same instant, the Federal fire began to fall off. It was now or never. On a bit of paper, Alexander scrawled to pick it. For God's sake, some quick. The eighteen guns have gone. Come quick or my ammunition will not let me support you properly. A messenger dashed off through the smoke with the paper. Pickett, at that moment, was in receipt of Alexander's previous dispatch. He read it and without a word passed it on to Longstreet, who had dismounted. Longstreet scrutinized it, but gave no order. General, said Pickett, anxiously, shall I advance? Still no answer from Longstreet. He turned and looked away, and then, as if the effort cost him his very heart's blood, slowly nodded his head. Pickett shook back his long hair and saluted. I am going to move forward, sir, he said, and galloped off. About that same time, a shell fell close to the ordnance train, which was parked near at hand. Fearing for the safety of all the ammunition the army had to replenish the gaping caissons, General Pendleton ordered the wagons to the rear and, a little later, recalled four of the nine 11-pounder howitzers that Alexander had not been able to employ in the bombardment but had intended to use in following up the advance. Major Richardson, left in charge of the other howitzers, moved them also, to get them out of the line of fire. Alexander must have been notified promptly of this, for when Longstreet rode to him after Pickett had left, Alexander told him that the howitzers were gone and that the ammunition of all the batteries was running low. Go and stop Pickett where he is, Longstreet said sharply, and replenish your ammunition. We can't do that, sir, Alexander said.
the train has but little. It would take an hour to distribute it, and meanwhile the enemy would improve the time. I do not want to make this charge, Longstreet said slowly and with deep emotion. I do not see how it can succeed. I would not make it now, but that General Lee has ordered it and is expecting it. With that he stopped, but he did not send word to Lee of the state of his ammunition. Lee received no intimation from any source that it was nearly exhausted. The Confederate artillerists paused now, for the infantry had to pass through the batteries. The Federal guns continued for a few minutes and then they, too, reserved their fire. Three hundred yards behind Alexander's batteries, the infantrymen realized that their time had come. Soon Pickett galloped up, as debonair as if he had been riding through the streets of Richmond under the eye of his affianced. Up, men, he called, and to your posts. Don't forget today that you are from old Virginia. Almost at the same moment, on the crest, Pettigrew called to Marshall, now, Colonel, for the honor of the good old North State, forward. General Garnett, buttoned to the neck in an old blue overcoat, and much too ill to take the field, mounted his great black horse and rode out in front of his column as it sprang into line. Kemper on his charger took position in advance of his willing regiments. Armistead, who was to support these two brigadiers, turned his horse's head and came up to the color sergeant of the 53rd Virginia. Sergeant, he cried, are you going to put those colors on the enemy's works today? I will try, sir, and if mortal men can do it, it shall be done. Then Armistead took off his hat, put it on the point of his sword and shouted in a voice that had never failed to reach the farthest man in his brigade, attention, 2nd Battalion, the Battalion of Direction. Forward, Guide Center. March! And turning his horse, he went on ahead of them, his white head a mark for the bullets that were soon to fly. Now the skirmish line was open, now Garnett and Kemper rode out. Behind Kemper was Colonel Epahunton of the 8th Virginia on his horse, and behind Garnett was mounted Colonel Lewis Williams of the 1st, both of them too sick to walk but neither of them willing to be left behind. All the other officers, by Pickett's orders, were afoot. And now the front brigades, except Davis's and Mayo's, were emerging from the woods. The front was oblique because of the greater distance Pettigrew had to cover, and there was a gap between Garnett's left and Fry's right. Once clear of the woods, at a word of command, the whole line was dressed until it was almost perfect in its formation. Nineteen battle flags were in sight, their red deepened by the sunlight, and the array seemed overpowering, but, as the smoke had lifted, those who looked on the right could see that the flank of Kemper was separated by almost half a mile from the left of McClaws, as if inviting an enfilade fire in its advance, or a counterattack should it fail. From the left, the sight was one to make men catch their breath. Far beyond that flank, in Gettysburg, Rhodes's soldiers called out to the Federal surgeons, there go the men who will go through your damned Yankee line for you. Lee saw it all, and the sight that stirred him most was that of the bandages on the heads and arms of some of Pettigrew's Carolinians. They had been wounded in the Battle of July 1st and had been mustered back into the ranks by their commander along with all the cooks and extra-duty men. Davis had come out of the woods by this time, as had Mayo's brigade, lagging on his left. Soon the supporting line was visible, to Armistead on the right, then Lawrence, then Lane on the left, and twenty-five more battle flags were visible. Armistead's left overlapped Lawrence's right at the start, but this was quickly rectified, and the whole swept forward at common time, Armistead's men with their arms at right shoulder. Each unit moved as if the distance had been taped and marked for a grand review. Two hundred yards forward and scarcely a shot. Kemper, moving sharply toward the left, was across the double fence at Spangler's Lane. Garnett's men, with scarcely a stir in their alignment, were negotiating the post and rail fence in their front and were sweeping through a lesser obstruction as if it were not there. Then, as if awakened from a dream, the Federal artillerists opened, not with the weakened fire that the supposed withdrawal of eighteen guns had led the Confederates to anticipate, but with the full fury of massed guns. The blast was concentrated on picket because Pettigrew was not yet within effective range. The shells tore gaps in the line, flags began to go down, behind the advancing ranks, dead and writhing men littered the ground. But the charge continued at the same measured pace, with scarcely the fire of a single southern musket. Soon the skirmishers were brought to a stand at the post and plank fences along the Emmitsburg Road.
They disputed this barrier with the Federal skirmishers who held their own until the main Confederate line was within 100 yards. Then the enemy fell back. Openings were made in the stubborn fence, but as the men made for these, they crowded together and offered a mark that the Federal gunners reached again and again. Once beyond the second fence on the eastern side of the road, Pickett's men were halted, and the line was drawn again with care. Armistead was close behind now, the flanks of Garnett's and of Archer's brigades had met, and Pettigrew's two right brigades, though they had been forced to cross a number of farm fences, had kept their formation admirably. Davis had caught up, but Mayo's brigade was falling behind more and more. All Pettigrew's units were now under artillery fire and were suffering heavily. Up the hill now, and at double time. Kemper swings still farther to the left, up a little swale, and his flank is bare to the enemy's bullets. More colors go down, hundreds of men have fallen. Still the formation is excellent, and the front is heavy enough to cover the 250 yards that separate the Confederate right from the wall. Here is the Federal advanced line already hidden in the tall grass. It fires and flees. A flash of flame, a roar, and the Federal infantry behind the stone wall has opened with their volley. From the right, a small Union command is tearing Kemper's flank. Garnett, still on that rearing black horse, is shouting to his men. The rebel yell rolls up the ridge in answer to the Federal challenge. Garnett is charging bayonets. The Union artillery has stopped its blasts on the right but is still pouring canister into Pettigrew. Only a hundred yards for Pickett now, hardly more. Fry's brigade has almost been absorbed by the commands on its right and left. Armistead is on the heels of Garnett and Kemper, Lawrence and Lane are fighting across the field in the rear of Pettigrew through bursting shell. Fire, cries Garnett, and his men for the first time pull trigger. Fire! Kemper echoes, and his troops send a volley against the wall at the same instant that their high, furious yell breaks out, Armistead had ridden back so that his line can fire, and his horse is down. There goes his volley, on the left, where the stone wall is farther up the ridge and higher, the Federal infantry have opened on Pettigrew. Twenty-five yards, only twenty-five to the barrier in Garnett's front. The grimy faces of the Federal infantry can be seen where the smoke lifts for an instant in front of the wall. But the lines are all in confusion now. Fry's men are mingled with Garnett's, Marshall's right is piling up on Garnett's left. Garnett is down, dead, and his horse is racing back toward the Confederate lines, a great gash in his shoulder, Kemper has fallen, the line is melting away on the right and on the left. Still the dauntless men rush upward. The Virginians and some of the Tennesseans and Carolinians are at the stone fence, and on their left the rest of Marshall's brigade is rushing into the open ground at the angle and fighting onto the wall, eighty yards farther eastward. Armistead is up now, at the low barrier, his sword is high, and his hat, pierced by the point of his sword, is down to the hilt of his blade. His voice is ringing out above the din, follow me. Over the wall then, with the bayonet, and onto the crest of the hill. About one hundred men of five brigades follow him into the melee, with butt and thrust, but they fall at every step. In the angle, Marshall's men press on. The enemy is all around them. Where are the thousands who marched in that proud line from the woods? Where are the flags and where are the supports? The right is in the air, they are bluecoats firing over there, not Confederates. And on the left, more Federals. The place is a death trap, are there no officers to tell one what to do? In the front are the enemy's batteries, Armistead lies yonder among the guns, forty yards within the wall, his left hand on a cannon, his right still grasping his sword. Davis has reached the wall and has recoiled, broken, Mayo's men have failed, the left has melted away. Lawrence and Lane are in the angle, but they are only a fragment. Are there no reinforcements to drive the victory home? Wilcox is advancing on the right and that is Perry's little brigade beside him, but they have lost direction. Instead of following Kemper's turn they are moving straight on, to annihilation if they continue. A few batteries have advanced, but their fire is weak and erratic. No support, no succor.
in the angle and beyond the wall, there is nothing to do but to struggle with those thickening masses of Federals, here and there an officer is calling out steady, men, pistols are being used against muskets, Captain M. P. Spessard yonder has stopped to take a last look at his dying son and then has sprung over the wall and is fighting with his bare sword in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with Federal infantrymen. That color sergeant is using his flagstaff as a lance, the flag of the 11th North Carolina has gone down again and again, and now Captain Francis Byrd is carrying it and rallying his men, the survivors, unconsciously crowding around the standards, are stumbling over the bodies of the dead, every minute sees the struggling remnants thinned. From the right there is a rush and a volley, on the left the Federals loose an overwhelming blast of musketry, in front, they stand stubbornly behind the wall at the angle and on the crest. The column is surrounded, there is no escape except in abandoning the heights, one with so much blood and valor. Every man for himself. Uplifted hands for the soldier whose musket has been struck down, a white handkerchief here, a cry of I surrender, and for the rest, back over the wall and out into the field again. The assault has failed. Men could do no more. Down the ridge toward Alexander's guns the Virginians made their way, straight across the field the men of Pettigrew's and of Trimble's divisions retired. Only a few kept the semblance of formation. Three hundred of Garnett's brigade, escaping by what seemed a miracle, slowly and sullenly came down to the Emmitsburg Road and onto the batteries. Men who could still walk hobbled along, some of them with two rifles as crutches, those whose legs had been broken or whose feet had been shot off dragged themselves toward the lines. On the whole field, only one or two battle flags were to be seen. The vengeful Federal artillery fire followed these retreating flags, but it was uncertain and scattering, for on the hill, too, ammunition had been almost spent. The repulse had been too costly. At last the survivors reached Alexander's guns and staggered onto the cover of the low ground west of the batteries. And there, there they found Lee astride Traveler. From the spot where the Virginia Monument now stands, he had witnessed, who presumes to say with what emotions. As much of the charge as was visible through the smoke and dust. As soon as he had seen that the assault was failing, he had ridden out to rally the men and to share the ordeal of the counterattack, if one was to come. In person, he had ordered Wright to support Wilcox, should the Alabamians be pursued. His one thought now was of those who had come back, dazed or wounded, from the ridge. With Longstreet and some staff officers he circulated among them. For everyone he encountered he had a word of cheer, all will come right in the end, we'll talk it over afterwards, we want all good and true men just now. A few would pass on bewildered, but most of them brightened when they recognized him, and some, even of the badly wounded, stopped to cheer him. All his self-mastery had been mustered for this supreme text, and he seemed to overlook nothing. When the roar of a federal cheer swept down from the left, Lee thought that perhaps Johnson on the other flank had gained some advantage and he directed Lt. F. M. Colston, Alexander's ordnance officer, to ride and see what it meant. Colston started, but his horse balked, and he began to belabor him with a stick. Don't whip him, Captain, Lee called, don't whip him. I've got such another foolish horse myself, and whipping does no good. He was still expecting a thrust by the enemy, and where he met a man whose wounds were light he told him, bind up your hurts and take a musket. One coward, who pretended to be injured, he ordered some nearby gunners to pull from a ditch and set on his feet. When Colonel Fremantle rode up to see the dreadful climax of the drama, Lee greeted him, this has been a sad day for us, Colonel, a sad day, but we can't always expect to win victories. And in the next breath, he cautioned the Britisher to seek a safer place. A little way off Lee saw Pickett, who had remained in the field watching his flanks and seeking support during the charge, and he hurried over to meet him. General Pickett, he began, place your division in rear of this hill, and be ready to repel the advance of the enemy should they follow up their advantage. At least one officer noticed that Lee said the enemy, instead of his usual those people, but Pickett was too nearly frantic with grief to remark Lee's language. General Lee, I have no division now. Armistead is down, Garnett is down, and Kemper is mortally wounded. Come, General Pickett, said Lee, this has been my fight and upon my shoulders rests the blame. The men and officers of your command have written the name of Virginia as high today as it has ever been written before. Some of the survivors crowded around the riders then, and Lee repeated, your men have done all that men could do, the fault is entirely my own.
At that moment, he noticed a litter being carried through the batteries. Captain, he said to one of Pickett's staff, what officer is that they are bearing off? General Kemper. I must speak to him, and he touched Traveler. When he overtook the litter, the bearers halted, and Kemper opened his eyes. Lee took his hand and pressed it. General Kemper, he said, I hope you are not very seriously wounded. I am struck in the groin, Kemper answered, calm amid his suffering, and the ball has ranged upward, they tell me it is mortal. I hope it may not prove so bad as that, is there anything I can do for you, General Kemper? In great pain, Kemper lifted himself on one elbow, yes, General Lee, do full justice to this division for its work today. Lee bowed his head. I will, he said. And the soldiers carried Kemper on. Presently, General Wilcox came up, in a battered straw hat. He had brought out his men by following the swale under the federal line, but his losses had been heavy, and as he tried to explain the condition of his brigade, his emotion overwhelmed him. Lee shook his hand. Never mind, General, all this has been my fault, it is I that have lost this fight, and you must help me out of it the best way you can. Then he turned once again to speak to the men from the ranks. Whatever their plight, he had comfort or cheer or exhortation. Some federal prisoners had been captured in the skirmish along the Emmitsburg Road, and one of them, who probably had been wounded as he made his way to the rear, was lying on the ground. The stout-hearted fellow cried out hurrah for the Union as Lee passed. The general heard him, stopped his horse, dismounted, and approached the bluecoat, who was satisfied that Lee intended to kill him. Instead, Lee looked down sadly at him and then extended his hand. My son, he said, I hope you will soon be well. Ere long the last of those who had survived the slaughter on the ridge passed wearily up the hill. Captain Byrd, who had taken the falling flag of the 11th North Carolina, had brought it off the field, though eight men had been hit while carrying it, and the staff of the battered colors had been struck twice while he held it. Captain Spessard, who had fought so splendidly, had managed to escape from his assailants. Trimble had been struck in the leg but had been carried to the rear. The carnage had been as frightful as in front of the stone wall at Fredericksburg. From Pickett's division only one field officer had found his way back to the lines. All the others had been killed or had been wounded and captured. Garnett had taken in more than 1,300 men and had lost 941. Pettigrew's brigade had but a solitary staff officer to rally the remnant, and of his whole division only 1,500 or 1,600 returned. The 38th North Carolina could muster a bare 40, under a 1st Lieutenant and Company A of the 11th North Carolina, which had crossed the Potomac with 100, had only eight men and a single officer. Yet the fighting spirit of the men had not been destroyed. Wright's and Posey's soldiers had been ready to go into the charge to support Wilcox when Longstreet had restrained Anderson with the assurance that the attack had failed and that a further attempt would simply be a waste of life. Colonel Fremantle, mingling with the gunners of an advanced battery, found the men anxious for the Federals to attack, and when they saw Lee they assured their visitor, we've not lost confidence in the old man, this day's work will do him no harm. Uncle Robert will get us into Washington yet, you bet he will. Sergeant Charles Belcher of the 24th Virginia, bringing back his colors from the ridge, had called out to Pickett, General, let us go it again, and in all the anguish and disappointment there was, as Colonel Fremantle attested, less noise, fuss or confusion of orders than in an ordinary field day. Two divisions were mere fragments, and the stream behind Seminary Ridge flowed red because so many men knelt to bathe their wounds. But the Army of Northern Virginia still had terror for the enemy. The attempts at a counterstroke were abortive, except on the extreme right, where General Farnsworth led a futile charge at the cost of his life. On Cemetery Ridge, where twenty fallen battle flags lay in a space one hundred yards square, so deep had the attacking column hacked its way toward the heart of the enemy that when supporting Union batteries came up and caught their first glimpse of the herded prisoners, the officers ordered a retreat. They believed the Confederates had stormed the ridge and they could not credit the evidence before their eyes that the men who had defeated them on so many fields were disarmed and helpless. Lee remained with Alexander more than half an hour, now in the open and now behind the edge of the ridge, where the group of horsemen could look over the crest without attracting the fire of the enemy. Slowly, then, when it was all over, he rode back toward headquarters.
If he saw Longstreet again, after encountering him while he was attempting to rally Pickett's survivors, there was not the slightest touch of crimination. Longstreet, in fact, having fortified himself with rum, was somewhat confused in mind. Although there is not the slightest suggestion that he was drunk, he was doubtful whether or not he had ordered McClaws to leave his exposed position. The few batteries that had attempted to follow the charge were gradually withdrawn, and after nightfall Alexander skillfully brought all his guns back to Seminary Ridge. The infantry were recalled from the right to a shorter line. They accomplished the maneuver without material interruption by the enemy. Lee had no complicated strategic problem to solve now, no alternatives to ponder. Retreat was the only course left open to him. The army had sustained such heavy losses it could not consider a renewal of the offensive. The greater part of the artillery was almost powerless for lack of ammunition. Federal troops would certainly attempt to seize the gaps in the mountains and to interfere with the evacuation of the wounded. Subsistence could not be had in the narrow area Lee could control. Orders were therefore issued before the day was out to prepare for the withdrawal as soon as the wounded and the wagon trains could be cleared. Lee left to Longstreet the completion of arrangements for the retirement of the First Corps. As he did not intend to move the Second Corps until last, Lee did not visit Ewell that night, but he rode over to A.P. Hill's headquarters to discuss with him the arrangements for the Third Corps, which was to head the column of retreat. After a long conference over the map, Lee walked Traveler back through the moonlight and the sleeping camps about 1 a.m. When he reached his own headquarters, where his exhausted staff officers had already sought repose, he was so weary that he could hardly dismount. With an effort he reached the ground and stood for a moment, leaning heavily on his horse. The moon shone full on his massive features, wrote one of the few witnesses, and revealed an expression of sadness that I had never before seen upon his face. Presently General Imboden, who had been ordered to await him on his return from Hill, addressed him in a sympathetic voice, General, this has been a hard day on you. Yes, it has been a sad, sad day for us, Lee answered mournfully, and relapsed into silence, thinking of the failure of the charge that might have won the battle and perhaps have decided the war. Then, after a minute or two, he straightened up and broke out with an excitement of manner that startled his companion, I never saw troops behave more magnificently than Pickett's division of Virginians did today in that grand charge upon the enemy. And if they had been supported as they were to have been, but for some reason not yet fully explained to me, were not, we would have held the position and the day would have been ours. Another pause, brief this time, and then he exclaimed in a voice that echoed loudly and grimly through the night, too bad. Too bad. Oh, too bad. Chapter 9 Why Was Gettysburg Lost? Would Meade attack? Every man in the Army of Northern Virginia put that question to himself on the morning of the 4th of July, and no man knew the answer. If the Federals had the strength to take the initiative, they would find the Confederates frightfully extended, bleeding, and almost without ammunition. Should the Union commander for any reason withhold attack, another Don would find Lee on his way back to Virginia, moving as fast as he could without endangering his wagon train. As the anxious hours passed without any sign of a Union offensive, the plans for the withdrawal took form. Instead of following the long route back to Chambersburg and thence to Hagerstown, the army was to go southwestward to Fairfield and westward to Greencastle. Stuart was to send a brigade or two of cavalry to hold the passes west of Cashtown on the Chambersburg Pike so that the Federal horse could not advance by that line and get ahead of the slower-moving Southern infantry before it reached the Potomac. The rest of the Confederate troopers were to use the Emmitsburg Road and protect the rear and left flank of the army. The wounded were to leave as soon as practicable. Hill was to follow. Then Longstreet was to take up the march and was to guard the prisoners. Ewell would cover the rear. All the wagons not used in transporting the wounded were to form a single train, placed midway the column. To prevent all misunderstandings, Lee issued these orders explicitly and in writing. A hundred troublesome details absorbed the weary commander of the defeated army. In an effort to relieve himself of the burden of 4,000 unwounded prisoners, he dispatched a flag of truce proposing an exchange, but Meade prudently declined. Engineers were sent back to select a line in rear of Hagerstown, in case the enemy pursued vigorously, the wounded were painfully assembled with great difficulty, and an artillery force was provided to supplement the escort, which consisted of Imboden's cavalry.
a brief report was prepared for the president. To add to the difficulties of the retreat, a torrential rain began to fall ominously about 1 p.m. and delayed the start of the ambulance train. Final preparations had to be made in a blinding storm. When at last the wounded were on their way, in rough wagons that were as torturing as the rack, fully 5,000 sulkers and sick contrived to march with them. Lee could not readily prevent this, but he was most solicitous that no panic or sense of demoralization spread among the troops. When Sandy Pendleton brought the daily report of the 2nd Corps, he said to Lee encouragingly, General, I hope the other two corps are in as good condition for work as ours is this morning. Lee was fond of Sandy, but talk of this sort was apt to create dangerous impressions, so he looked steadily at young Pendleton and said, coldly, what reason have you, young man, to suppose they are not? To sustain the morale, he moved about as calmly as if the withdrawal of the army in the face of the foe were a simple summer's day field maneuver. He had little to say, but when he rode past the camps of the Texans and was welcomed with their loyal cheer, he was not too much absorbed in his own somber thoughts to raise his hat in acknowledgement of their greeting. In the afternoon, while the storm raged, Lee, without a tremor visible to anyone, surveyed from one of the ridges the tragic scene of the defeat, and when, in the evening, he stopped at Longstreet's bivouac on the roadside, his remark was the same as that with which he had met Pickett on the field after the fatal charge, it's all my fault, he said, I thought my men were invincible. Longstreet had lost his sullenness in the face of the disaster to the army, and though he and Lee did not talk of the battle, Longstreet calmly voiced his sobered opinion to Colonel Fremantle. The assault had failed, he said, because it had not been made with a sufficient number of men. He made no reference then to the rejection of his plan of moving by the right in an effort to get between the enemy and Washington. The next day, July 5th, was sixteen daylight hours of purgatory. The rain was falling as heavily as ever, the men were muddy, wet, and hungry. So slowly did the other corps drag themselves along the blocked road that it was 2 a.m. before Ewell left the field of Gettysburg and 4 p.m. by the time he reached Fairfield, which was less than nine miles from his starting point. Even then, some of his wagons were lost. Ewell was so outraged by this that he wished to turn back and get immediate revenge, but Lee refused to countenance such a foolish adventure. No, no, General Ewell, he said, we must let those people alone for the present, we will try them again some other time. The rain continued during the night of July 5-6, but as the leading corps was then through the mountains it was able to move, unabashed, at greater speed than it had ever made before in putting distance between itself and its old adversary. Let him who will say it to the contrary, one Texas recruit confided in a letter to his wife, we made Manassas time from Pennsylvania. At five o'clock on the afternoon of the 6th, Longstreet's corps, which was then in the van, succeeded in reaching Hagerstown. Lee rode with it and found to his vast relief that the ambulance train had arrived at Williamsport that day with the wounded. But the elements had again done battle against the south, the pontoon bridge below the town had been broken up by a raiding party, and the Potomac, swollen by the rains, was far past fording. The army, its wounded and its prisoners, were cut off from Virginia soil. More than that, a mixed force of federal cavalry and artillery had appeared in the rear and had threatened the capture of the wagons and their pain-racked loads. The Teamsters had been organized, however, to support Imboden, two regiments of infantry that had been returning from Winchester had been rushed up and the attack had been held off until Stuart had arrived with his cavalry. The Federals had then been repulsed. Despite this success, the situation was worse than serious. The raging river was so high that some days, perhaps a week, would pass before it was fordable. The country roundabout had already been foraged, few supplies could be collected. Meade, in Lee's opinion, was certainly pursuing in the hope of attacking before he crossed the Potomac. Any long delay would involve another battle in Maryland, and a disaster with the river at flood would mean annihilation. Lee's first thought was for his wounded. He gave orders that all the ferry boats in the vicinity should be collected so that he might use them in transporting the sufferers to the south bank. The wagons must wait until the river subsided or until the pontoon bridge could be reconstructed, and if Meade attacked, the army must prepare to give battle once more to the Federals. Fortunately, the engineers had found and had laid out an admirable defensive line. It extended from Downsville, which lies three miles south of Williamsport, northward in front of that town to the Conicoheague. Both flanks were well covered. 
The men in the ranks were not conscious of the danger they faced, or else they defied it. They were in sight of their own country once more, and their morale seemed unimpaired, thin as were the ranks. We are all right at Hagerstown, one of Lee's staff officers wrote his sister reassuringly, and we hope soon to get up another fight. Another young soldier maintained, the army is in fine spirits and confident of success when they again meet the enemy. Lee himself reported the condition of the army good and its confidence unimpaired. The bands began to play again, and the soldiers renewed their jests. Some of the men were not so mindful as Lee had commanded in respecting the property of the Maryland farmers and had to be given stern orders not to forage or to steal horses. Finding one battalion of artillery burning fence rails, Lee sent for the major and asked if a copy of General Orders No. 73 had reached him. The officer admitted that he had received those famous instructions against damaging the property of civilians. Then, sir, said Lee, you must not only have them published, but you must see that they are obeyed. In the press of duties in front of Williamsport, Lee found the loss and suffering of his men brought home to him. On June 26, his own son, Rooney Lee, wounded at Brandy Station, had been taken from his bed at Hickory Hill, Hanover County, by a federal raiding party, and had been carried to Fort Monroe, where he was held hostage for the good treatment of some federal officers who had been threatened with death as a measure of retaliation. Lee's warmth of feeling for Rooney made the capture of his son a deep personal sorrow, and he hastened, busy as he was, to send comforting words to the soldier's young wife. Not for a moment, however, did Lee let his concern for Rooney or his uneasiness for his troops shake his equanimity. No trace of resentment was there in his dealings with the men who had failed him. He greeted Longstreet cordially as my old war horse. In fact, for months thereafter Lee showed more than usual warmth to Longstreet, as if to make it plain that he did not blame him and did not countenance any whispering against Longstreet that might cause dissension in the army. When Captain Ross, the Austrian observer, came to call, Lee talked of Gettysburg as if all the fault had been his own. He told Ross that if he had been aware that Meade had been able to concentrate his whole army, he would not have attacked him, but that the success of the first day, the belief that Meade had only a part of his army on the field, and the enthusiasm of his own troops had led him to conclude that the possible results of a victory justified the risks. He added that his lack of accurate knowledge of the enemy's concentration was due to the absence of Stuart's cavalry. In writing to the president, he was full of fight and urged once more that Beauregard's army be brought to the Upper Rappahannock for a demonstration on Washington. I hope, he said, your excellency will understand that I am not in the least discouraged, or that my faith in the protection of an all-wise providence, or in the fortitude of this army, is at all shaken. But, though conscious that the enemy has been much shattered in the recent battle, I am aware that he can be easily reinforced, while no addition can be made to our numbers. The measure, therefore, that I have recommended is altogether one of a prudential nature. This was written on the 8th of July. The next night, an officer who had escaped from the Federals at Gettysburg arrived with news that the enemy was marching on Hagerstown. This confirmed Lee's belief that Meade intended to attack him north of the Potomac, and he prepared accordingly. His cavalry were thrown out as a wide screen and the infantry were moved into the lines prepared for them. In person he supervised the posting of Longstreet's men, he issued a stirring appeal to the army to meet once more the onslaughts of the enemy. He did not lose grip on himself, but to Colonel Alexander, who observed him on many fields, Lee never appeared as deeply anxious as on July 10. The wounded and the prisoners were not yet across the river, supplies sufficed only from day to day because the floodwaters made it impossible to operate some of the flour mills, forage was getting very scarce, and the horses were subsisting only on grass and standing grain. The Federals had been approaching cautiously, but by the 12th they grew bolder and appeared in considerable strength around Boonesboro and Sharpsburg. Lee's mind wavered between hope and anxiety. Had the river not unexpectedly risen, he wrote his wife, all would have been well with us, but God, in his all-wise providence, ruled otherwise, and our communications have been interrupted and almost cut off. The waters have subsided to about four feet, and if they continue, by tomorrow, I hope, our communications will be open. I trust that a merciful God, our only hope and refuge, will not desert us in this hour of need, and will deliver us by his almighty hand, that the whole world may recognize his power and all hearts be lifted up in adoration and praise of his unbounded loving-kindness. We must, however, submit to his almighty will, whatever that may be.
Lee's prayers seemed answered on the 13th, Jackson's handyman, the resourceful Major J. I. Harmon, had torn down old warehouses and had constructed a number of crude boats that had been floated down to falling waters, where some of the original pontoon had been recovered. With these a crossing had been laid, a good bridge in Lee's thankful eyes, a crazy affair to the more critical Colonel Sorrel. The river at Williamsport was still deep but fordable, at last, by infantry. Lee determined not to delay a day in reaching a wider field of maneuver on the south shore of the forbidding Potomac. To expedite his movement he decided to use both the ford and the pontoons, Ewell to cross by the former route, and the trains and the rest of the army by the bridge. Longstreet demurred at this withdrawal, because there was a chance of fighting a defensive battle on ground to his liking, but Lee overruled him and personally directed the preparations for the crossing. That afternoon, as if to defeat the whole difficult enterprise, rain began to descend heavily. By nightfall, the river seemed to be pouring from the skies. As Ewell's road to Williamsport was hard surfaced, his progress was steady, but at the ford there was much confusion. Nerves grew raw under the strain. A new road had been cut to the bridge at Falling Waters, and under the downpour this soon became so heavy that the wagons began to stall. Instead of the swift march, for which Lee had hoped, there was a virtual blockade. Hours passed while drenched and wretched thousands stood wearily waiting for the trains to move on. All night the laboring teams struggled through the mire, and soldiers strained at the hub-deep wheels. Lee sat on his horse at the north end of the bridge, encouraging the men until even his strong frame grew weary. The best standing points were ankle-deep in mud, Longstreet recorded, and the roads halfway to the knee, puddling and getting worse. We could only keep three or four torches alight, and those were dimmed at times when heavy rains came. Toward morning the report was that Ewell's column would soon be in Virginia, but at falling waters dawn found the rear of the wagon train still swaying uneasily on the pontoon bridge. Longstreet and Hill were yet to cross, with every prospect of being attacked while on the march. Leaving Longstreet to direct the movement on the north side of the river, Lee went to the southern shore to expedite the clearing of the bridge, and there he waited while the survivors of Longstreet's corps tramped through the rain. It was the last time Lee ever passed over that stream as a soldier. Finally, the rear brigade of Longstreet's corps reached the bridgehead. Only Hill and the cavalry remained behind. Lee's anxiety was not wholly relieved, for, while he was grateful that so large a part of the army had escaped, he believed it certain that Meade would attack Hill. When Colonel Sorrell rode up and reported that Longstreet's last file had passed, Lee bade him return and urge the Third Corps to make the utmost haste and not to halt unless compelled to do so. Soon Sorrell came back and announced that the road was clear. Hill, he said, was only three quarters of a mile from the bridge. What was his leading division? Lee inquired. General Anderson, sir, Sorrel answered. I am sorry, Colonel, my friend Dick is quick enough pursuing, but in retreat I fear he will not be as sharp as I should like. At that moment the echo of a heavy gun rolled up the river gorge. There, the general exclaimed. I was expecting it, the beginning of the attack. But instead of halting or stampeding at the sound, Hill's tired troops continued their steady tramp across the bridge. Ere long General Lee learned that only the rear division, Hates, was in contact with the enemy, and that it was holding its own. At one time Haight dispatched an officer to request that Pender's division be sent back to reinforce him, but when ordered to continue his movement, he contrived to reach the river with no other loss than that of the stragglers and sick whom he had not been able to push on ahead of him. As the bulk of the rear guard of the army safely passed over the shaky bridge, one observer testified, as it swayed to and fro, lashed by the current, Lee uttered a sigh of relief, and a great weight seemed taken from his shoulders. Seeing his fatigue and exhaustion, General Stewart gave him some coffee, he drank it with avidity, and declared, as he handed back the cup, that nothing had ever refreshed him so much. The final operation had been more harrowing, in the opinion of General Lane, than even the first stages of the retreat from Gettysburg. Men had become so weary that they had fallen asleep in the rain and mud whenever the column had halted. One South Carolina colonel, who had been in all of Lee's campaigns, pronounced it the severest march his men had ever made. Hate had required twelve torturing hours to cover seven miles. But the retreat was over. The Potomac stood between the battered army of Northern Virginia and the disappointed Federals.
many were the regrets that the Confederates had been allowed to escape. Loud were the protests that Meade had not pushed his pursuit vigorously. As the army manifestly must have rest, Lee moved it on the 15th to the vicinity of Bunker Hill. His expectation was to advance into Loudoun County, but the swollen Shenandoah prevented an early crossing. Forced to remain temporarily where he was, Lee sent out men and horses, threshed wheat, carried it to the mills, ground it, and, with the beef captured in Pennsylvania, contrived to give a sufficient ration to the hungry army. Thousands of the cavalrymen were dismounted because their horses had not been shod and had become lame. Robertson's brigade had been diminished, chiefly on this account, to a bare 300. Lee collected horseshoes as rapidly as practicable, reduced transportation once more, procured corn for animals that had not tasted it since Gettysburg, and did what he could at so great a distance from Richmond to refit the troops. Before Lee could make more than a start in the never-ending work of reconstruction, Meade crossed the Potomac east of the Blue Ridge and advanced his cavalry to the passes into Loudoun. Fearing that this might presage an attempt to keep him in the valley while the enemy moved on Richmond, Lee promptly made counter-dispositions and placed Longstreet in Manassas and Chester Gaps before the enemy could take them. With the waters lowered somewhat, a pontoon bridge was then thrown over the Shenandoah, Longstreet's remaining troops crossed, passed through Chester Gap, and reached Culpeper on July 24. Hill followed. Ewell, who was left in the valley in the hope of picking off a force at Martinsburg, then moved to Madison Courthouse, where he arrived on July 29. A force left at Manassas Gap had an affair with the enemy, but drew off with no great difficulty and rejoined the main army. The enemy shifted to Warrington, and from that base on the night of July 31 to August 1 sent a cavalry column and some infantry across the Rappahannock. The Confederate horse promptly opposed this advance, but as the Federal movement might be the initial step in a maneuver to catch him between the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, or else to resume operations in front of Fredericksburg, Lee decided to transfer his whole army south of the Rapidan. This was accomplished by August 4, on which date the Gettysburg campaign may be said to have come to its conclusion, with the opposing troops holding almost the very ground whence Jackson had started the first stage of Lee's offensive a year previously. The rapid changes of position during this last phase of the campaign were made with little loss and in good spirit. There was, however, the inevitable reaction that follows open campaigning, and among the North Carolina conscripts some desertions occurred. To disappointed civilian eyes, the morale of the troops seemed lower than usual. Even Major Walter Taylor, who was more familiar with the temper of the tired men, had already been compelled to admit that the army was better satisfied when on southern soil. By the second week in August, this reaction was passed, and the spirits of officers and men were high again. This is a grand old army. Taylor wrote proudly, soon after Lee's headquarters had been established at Orange and the two armies had become inactive. No despondency here, he exclaimed, though we hear of it in Richmond. Disappointment was, indeed, general at the capital, and there was much questioning throughout the South. Lee refused to accept this as justified, and remarked that little value was to be attached to popular judgment of victories or of defeats. He told Major Seddon that after Fredericksburg and again after Chancellorsville, he had been greatly depressed because he could not follow up either success, but the country had been jubilant over the outcome of both battles. As far as I am concerned, he said of one series of hostile complaints, the remarks fall harmless, but he felt that censure of the army did harm at home and abroad. When General Pickett filed a report in which he complained of the lack of support given him in the charge, Lee returned the document. You and your men have covered yourself with glory, he said, but we have the enemy to fight and must carefully, at this critical moment, guard against dissensions which the reflections in your report would create. I will, therefore, suggest that you destroy both copy and original, substituting one confined to casualties merely. I hope all will yet be well. In preparing his own report the following January, he struck from Major Marshall's draft all specific criticism. Despite Lee's example and influence, criticism of the Confederate operations at Gettysburg was not silenced in 1863 and has been expressed at intervals ever since. Where confined to the actual military details of the campaign, this criticism is easily analyzed, for no other American battle has been so fully studied, and concerning none is there more general agreement on the specific reasons for the failure of the losing army.
The invasion itself was, of course, a daring move, but, in the circumstances that Lee faced, politically and in a military sense, it probably was justified. The first mistake was in connection with Stuart's operations. To recapitulate this point, Lee intended to allow his cavalry commander latitude as to where he should enter Maryland. He is not to be blamed for giving Stuart discretion, nor is Stuart justly subject to censure for exercising it. But the Beau suburb of the South, by pushing on after he had encountered resistance east of the Bull Run Mountains, violated orders and deprived Lee of his services when most needed. He should have turned back then, as Lee had directed him to do should he find his advance hindered by federal columns. Stuart erred, likewise, in taking with him all the cavalry brigades that had been accustomed to doing the reconnaissance work of the Army of Northern Virginia. General Lee, for his part, was at fault in handling the cavalry left at his disposal. He overestimated the fighting value of Jenkins's and of Imboden's brigades, which had little previous experience except in raids, and he failed to keep in close touch with Robertson and Jones, who remained behind in Virginia. Once in Pennsylvania, Lee's operations were handicapped not only because he lacked sufficient cavalry, but also because he did not have Stuart at hand. He had become dependent upon that officer for information of the enemy's position and plans, and, in Stuart's absence, he had no satisfactory form of military intelligence. It is not enough to say with General Early, in exculpation of Stuart, that Lee found the enemy in spite of the absence of his cavalry. Had Jeb Stuart been at hand, Lee would have had early information of the advance of the Federals and either would have outfooted them to Gettysburg or would have known enough about their great strength to refrain from attacking as he did. The injudicious employment of the Confederate horse during the Gettysburg campaign was responsible for most of the other mistakes on the southern side and must always remain a warning of the danger of permitting the cavalry to lose contact with an army when the enemy's positions are unknown. In its consequences, the blunder was more serious than that which Hooker made at Chancellorsville in sending Stoneman on a raid when he should have had his mounted forces in front and on the flank of the XI Corps. The second reason for the Confederate defeat manifestly was the failure of Ewell to take Cemetery Hill when Lee suggested, after the Federal defeat on the afternoon of July 1, that he attack it. Had Ewell thrown early forward, without waiting for Johnson, he probably could have taken the hill at any time prior to 4 p.m. or perhaps to 4.30. Ewell hesitated because he was unfamiliar with Lee's methods and had been trained in a different school of command. Jackson, who had always directed Ewell's operations, had been uniformly explicit in his orders and had never allowed discretion unless compelled to do so, Lee always trusted the tactical judgment of his principal subordinates unless he had to be peremptory. Ewell, moreover, was of a temperament to take counsel and was puzzled and embarrassed when told to capture Cemetery Hill if practicable. Lee could not be expected to change his system for Ewell, nor could Ewell be expected to change his nature after only two months under Lee. The third reason for defeat was the extent of the Confederate line and the resultant thinness. Lee's front on the second day, from Hood's right, opposite Round Top, to the left of Johnson, was slightly more than five miles in length. Communication between the flanks was slow and difficult. Coordination of attack was almost impossible with a limited staff. Lee should have held to the decision reached late on the afternoon of the 1st and considered again on the morning of the 2D. He should have abandoned all attempts against the Culp's Hill position. By concentrating his attacks from Cemetery Hill to Round Top, he would have increased the offensive strength of his line by at least one-third. In doing this, he would not have subjected himself to a dangerous enfilade from Cemetery Hill, because he had sufficient artillery to put that hill under crossfire from Seminary Ridge and from Gettysburg. Lee finally discarded the plan of shortening his line on the representation of Ewell that Johnson could take Culp's Hill, an instance where the advantage that would certainly have resulted from a concentrated attack was put aside for the uncertainty of a coup on the flank. The fourth reason for the defeat was the state of mind of the responsible Confederate commanders. On July 2, Longstreet was disgruntled because Lee refused to take his advice for a tactical defensive. Determined, apparently, to force a situation in which his plan would have to be adopted in spite of Lee, he delayed the attack on the right until Cemetery Ridge was crowded with men, whereas if he had attacked early in the morning, as Lee intended, he probably could have stormed that position and assuredly could have taken round top. Longstreet's slow and stubborn mind rendered him incapable of the quick daring and loyal obedience that had characterized Jackson.
Yet in the first battle after the death of Stonewall it seemed the course of wisdom to substitute the first for the second corps as the column of attack because its staff and line were accustomed to working together. Longstreet's innate lack of qualification for duty of this type had been confirmed by his period of detached duty. He was never the same man after he had deceived himself into thinking he was a great strategist. It was Lee's misfortune at Gettysburg that he had to employ in offensive operations a man whose whole inclination was toward the defensive. But this indictment of Longstreet does not relieve Lee of all blame for the failure on the second day at Gettysburg. His greatest weakness as a soldier was displayed along with Longstreet's, for when Longstreet sulked, Lee's temperament was such that he could not bring himself either to shake Longstreet out of his bad humor by a sharp order or to take direction of the field when Longstreet delayed. No candid critic of the battle can follow the events of that fateful morning and not have a feeling that Lee virtually surrendered to Longstreet, who abate only when he could no longer find an excuse for delay. Lee's one positive order was that delivered about eleven o'clock for Longstreet to attack. Having done this much, Lee permitted Longstreet to waste the time until after four o'clock. It is scarcely too much to say that on July 2nd the Army of Northern Virginia was without a commander. Overconfidence the conclusion is inevitable, moreover, that Lee allowed operations to drift on the morning of the 2D, not only because he would not deal sternly with Longstreet but also because he placed such unquestioning reliance on his army that he believed the men in the ranks could redeem Longstreet's delay. If Longstreet was insubordinate, Lee was overconfident. This psychological factor of the overconfidence of the commanding general is almost of sufficient importance to be regarded as a separate reason for the Confederate defeat. The mind of Ewell was similarly at fault on July 2. Although he had then been given his direct orders by Lee in person, Ewell either did not comprehend the importance of the task assigned him or else he was unable to coordinate the attacks of his three divisions, two of which were under commanders almost as unfamiliar with their duties as he was. Ewell's attacks were those of Lee at Malvern Hill or those of McClellan at Sharpsburg, isolated, disjointed, and ineffective. Had Early and Rhodes engaged when Johnson made his assault, there is at least a probability that Early could have held Cemetery Hill. If he had done so, the evacuation of Cemetery Ridge would have been necessary that night, or else Pickett's charge could have been driven home with the help of a shattering Confederate fire from the captured eminence. Fifth and most fundamental among the reasons for Lee's failure at Gettysburg was the general lack by the reorganized Army of Coordination in attack. Some of the instances of this on July 2 had already been given. To these may be added the failure of A.P. Hill's Corps to support the advance of Wright and of Wilcox when the attack of the 1st Corps reached the front of the 3rd. General Wilcox maintained that Anderson's division was badly handled then and that the captured ground could have been retained if Anderson had been on the alert. Wilcox may have been in error concerning some of the details, but the impression left by the operations of Hill's Corps is that they were not unified and directed to the all-important object of seizing and holding Cemetery Ridge. An even greater lack of coordination was apparent on the 3D. It was imperative on the last day of the battle that the three corps act together with absolute precision, for everyone must have realized that another repulse would necessitate a retreat. Yet the reorganized army did not fight as a single machine. Longstreet could have had picket on the field at dawn and could have attacked when Ewell did, but he was still so intent on carrying his own point and moving by the right flank that he devoted himself to that plan instead of hurrying picket into position. When Longstreet would not attack with his whole corps, Lee made the mistake of shifting his attack northward and of delivering it with parts of two corps. Pickett and Pettigrew advanced together almost as well as if they had belonged to the same corps, but there was no coordination of their support. The men at the time, and critics since then, seem to have been so intent on watching the charge that they have forgotten the tragic fact that after the two assaulting divisions reached Cemetery Ridge, they received no reinforcements. Probably it was the course of wisdom not to have rushed Anderson forward along with Pickett and Pettigrew, but there has never been any satisfactory explanation why Wilcox's advance was delayed or the whole of Anderson's division was not thrown in when it was apparent that Pickett and Pettigrew would reach the enemy's position. It was probably to this that Lee referred, on the night of July 3, in his conversation with General M. Bowden. There were risks, of course, in hurling all the troops against Cemetery Ridge and leaving none in reserve, but Lee had done the same thing at Gaines's Mill and at Second Manassas, and in both instances had driven the enemy from the field.
Similarly, the advance of the left brigade of Pettigrew's division was ragged and uncertain from the moment it started, yet nothing was done by Hill or by Longstreet to strengthen that flank or to create a diversion. On the front of Ewell that day there was no coordination of his attack with Longstreet or even coordination of his own divisions. Two of Ewell's divisions waited while Johnson wore himself out on Culp's Hill during the morning, and then, in the afternoon, those two in turn were repulsed. Ewell was ready to assault when the day was young, but Longstreet was not then willing. When Longstreet at last was forced into action, Ewell was half crippled. Lack of coordination was displayed in the artillery as well. So much has been written of the volume of the fire delivered against Cemetery Ridge that few students of the battle have stopped to count the batteries that were not utilized. Colonel Jennings C. Wise has computed that 56 of Lee's field pieces were not employed at all on July 3, and that 80 of the 84 guns of the 2nd and 3rd Corps were brought into action on a mathematically straight line, parallel to the position of the enemy and constantly increasing in range therefrom to the left or north. Nearly the whole value of converging fire was neglected. Furthermore, the Confederates lost the greatest opportunity of the battle when they did not dispose their artillery to blast the Federals from Cemetery Hill. That eminence stands at the northwestern turn of the long Federal line, the bend of the fishhook, and is open to attack by artillery on an arc of more than 200 degrees from the northeast, the north, the northward, and the west. A concentrated bombardment on the 2D would have driven the Federals from the hill and would have made its capture easy. Once in Confederate hands, it could have been a point d'appui for an attack on Cemetery Ridge. A short cannonade of Cemetery Hill on the 3D, more or less a chance affair, played havoc with the Federal batteries stationed there and indicated what might have happened under a heavier fire. It is almost incredible that this opening was overlooked by the Chief of Artillery of the Army or by the gunners of the 2nd and 3rd Corps. There are only two possible explanations. One is that General Pendleton devoted himself to reconnaissance, chiefly on the right, instead of studying the proper disposition of the guns. The other is that the lines of the two corps chanced to join in front of Cemetery Hill, so that liaison was poor. Neither Colonel Lindsay Walker of the 3rd nor Colonel John Thompson Brown of the 2nd seems to have realized to what extent the hill was exposed. Southern critics of Gettysburg, admitting all these mistakes, have been wont to say that while each error was serious, the battle would not have been lost if any one of the blunders had been avoided. There is a probability at least as strong that few of the mistakes would have occurred if Jackson had not died and a reorganization of the army had not thereby been made necessary. Then it was that Lee was compelled to place two-thirds of the troops under corps commanders who had never directed that many men in battle, then it was that the sentimental demand of the South led him to put at the head of the reduced Second Corps the gallant Ewell who had never served directly under Lee and was unfamiliar with his discretionary methods, then it was that new division commanders were chosen, then it was that the staff, which was always too small, was divided among generals who were unacquainted with the staff personnel, with the troops, and even with the field officers, then it was that Longstreet, by the ill chance of war, was cast for the role of the irreplaceable Jackson and became the appointed leader of the column of attack, the duty of all others for which he was least suited. Read in the light of the aftermath, the story of the reorganization of May, 1863, thus becomes one of the major tragedies of the Confederacy and explains why the death of Jackson was the turning point in the history of the Army of Northern Virginia. Such, in brief, were the principal Confederate mistakes at Gettysburg and some of the reasons for them as they appear to the student after 70 years. How did those errors appear to Lee? What was his judgment of the battle and of the campaign? Said he, the loss of our gallant officers and men causes me to weep tears of blood and to wish that I never could hear the sound of a gun again. More than 23,000 Southerners had been killed, wounded, and captured by the enemy from the beginning of the campaign at Brandy Station to the return to the lines on the Rapidan, June 9 to August 4. Five guns had been lost, approximately 50 wagons, and more than 30 flags. Lee believed, however, that the enemy had paid a price in proportion, and he was far from thinking that the invasion had been fruitless. Much of what he hoped to achieve had been accomplished, the enemy had been driven from the Shenandoah Valley, the hostile forces on the coast of Virginia and the Carolinas had been reduced, the federal plan of campaign for the summer had been broken up, and there was little prospect of a resumption of the offensive that year by the Union forces in Virginia.
he was no more prepared to admit a crushing defeat than Meade was to claim one, and perhaps he shared the philosophical view later expressed by General Early that if the army had remained in Virginia it would have been forced to fight battles with losses as heavy as those of Gettysburg. As criticism spread, Lee was quick to absolve his men of all responsibility for failure to attain the full objective. The army, he wrote Mrs. Lee on July 15, has accomplished all that could be reasonably expected. It ought not to have been expected to perform impossibilities or to have fulfilled the anticipations of the thoughtless and unreasonable. In his preliminary report of July 31st he said, The conduct of the troops was all that I could desire or expect, and they deserve success so far as it can be deserved by heroic valor and fortitude. More may have been required of them than they were able to perform, but my admiration of their noble qualities and confidence in their ability to cope successfully with the enemy has suffered no abatement from the issue of this protracted and sanguinary conflict. He hoped that the final reports would protect the reputation of every officer, and he was determined not to blame any of his subordinates. I know, he said, how prone we are to censure and how ready to blame others for the non-fulfillment of our expectations. This is unbecoming in a generous people, and I grieve to see its expression overconfidence he felt that he had himself been at fault in expecting too much of the army. His confidence in it, he frankly confessed, had carried him too far, an opinion that was shared by some of the men in the ranks. Overlooking all the tactical errors and all the mistakes due to the state of mind of his subordinates, he went straight to the underlying cause of failure when he said it was due primarily to lack of coordination. On July 13, in a long letter to President Davis, he summed up his views. The army, in my opinion achieved under the guidance of the most high a general success, though it did not win a victory. I thought at the time that the latter was practicable. I still think that if all things would have worked together it would have been accomplished. But with the knowledge I then had, and in the circumstances I was then placed, I do not know what better course I could have pursued. With my present knowledge, and could I have foreseen that the attack on the last day would have failed to drive the enemy from his position, I should certainly have tried some other course. What the ultimate result would have been is not so clear to me. After reflecting fully on the outcome in the comparative quiet of his camp at Orange Courthouse, he decided that he should ask to be relieved of the command of the army. In the course of a deliberately written letter to the president he said, the general remedy for the want of success in a military commander is his removal. This is natural and, in many instances, proper. For, no matter what may be the ability of this officer, if he loses the confidence of his troops disaster must sooner or later ensue. I have been prompted by these reflections more than once since my return from Pennsylvania to propose to Your Excellency the propriety of selecting another commander for this army. I have seen and heard of expression of discontent in the public journals at the result of the expedition. I do not know how far this feeling extends in the army. My brother officers have been too kind to report it, and so far the troops have been too generous to exhibit it. It is fair, however, to suppose that it does exist, and success is so necessary to us that nothing should be risked to secure it. I therefore, in all sincerity, request Your Excellency to take measures to supply my place. I do this with the more earnestness because no one is more aware than myself of my inability for the duties of my position. I cannot even accomplish what I myself desire. How can I fulfill the expectations of others? In addition, I sensibly feel the growing failure of my bodily strength. I have not yet recovered from the attack I experienced the past spring. I am becoming more and more incapable of exertion and am thus prevented from making the personal examinations and giving the personal supervision to the operations in the field which I feel to be necessary. I am so dull in making use of the eyes of others I am frequently misled. Everything, therefore, points to the advantages to be derived from a new commander and I the more anxiously urge the matter upon Your Excellency from my belief that a younger and abler man than myself can readily be obtained. I know that he will have as gallant and brave an army as ever existed to second his efforts, and it would be the happiest day of my life to see at its head a worthy leader, one that would accomplish more than I could perform and all that I have wished. I hope Your Excellency will attribute my request to the true reason, the desire to serve my country, and to do all in my power to ensure the success of her righteous cause. I have no complaints to make of anyone but myself. I have received nothing but kindness from those above me and the most considerate attention from my comrades and companions in arms.
To your excellency, I am specially indebted for uniform kindness and consideration. You have done everything in your power to aid me in the work committed to my charge, without omitting anything to promote the general welfare. I pray that your efforts may at length be crowned with success, and that you may long live to enjoy the thanks of a grateful people. Lee said nothing to anyone of this letter, though its language indicates that it was written with an eye to its possible publication in case the President saw fit to relieve him of command. There is not a hint in any other contemporary paper that he had asked to be relieved, though there had been a rumor, about ten days before, that he had resigned. He had not long to wait for the President's decision. In a reply to General Pemberton, who had sustained a far worse defeat, Mr. Davis had said on August 9, My confidence in both, you and Lee, has not been diminished because letter writers have not sent forth your praise on the wings of the press. On August 12 or 13, Lee received from Mr. Davis a long answer in which the chief executive deplored the clamor of the times and then continued. But suppose, my dear friend, that I were to admit, with all their implications, the points which you present, where am I to find that new commander who is to possess the greater ability which you believe to be required? I do not doubt the readiness with which you would give way to one who could accomplish all that you have wished, and you will do me the justice to believe that if Providence should kindly offer such a person for our use, I would not hesitate to avail of his services. My sight is not sufficiently penetrating to discover such hidden merit, if it exists, and I have but used the language of sober earnestness when I have impressed upon you the propriety of avoiding all unnecessary exposure to danger, because I felt our country could not bear to lose you. To ask me to substitute you by someone in my judgment more fit to command, or who would possess more of the confidence of the army, or of the reflecting men of the country, is to demand an impossibility. That ended it. Lee had to go on. Perhaps it was fortunate for the South that his request to be relieved of command did not become known, for the mere suggestion of such a possibility might have created discontent akin to mutiny in the Army of Northern Virginia. There probably was no exaggeration in the statement of one veteran, years afterward, that the Army would have arisen in revolt if it had been called upon to give up General Lee. The discussion of Gettysburg, however, did not end with this private exchange of letters. It continued into the winter and to the close of General Lee's life. To Longstreet's credit be it said that he did not criticize his chief at the time or argue in public the alleged virtues of his plan of operations, which he continued to believe superior to Lee's. In a letter to his uncle, three weeks after the battle, he expressed willingness to assume his share of the responsibility, all of it, in fact. He claimed at a later date that Lee asked him after the campaign, why didn't you stop all that thing that day? Subsequently, also, he maintained that Lee told a staff officer of the 1st Corps in the winter of 18631864 that if Longstreet had been permitted to carry out his plan, instead of making the attack on Cemetery Ridge, he would have been successful. In East Tennessee, again, Longstreet showed a friend a letter in which Lee was quoted as saying, Oh, General, had I but followed your advice, instead of pursuing the course that I did, how different all would have been. But in the face of charges that these statements were torn from their context, and in spite of a challenge to produce the originals, Longstreet remained silent. Not until General Lee had been dead for years did General Longstreet make the remarkable assertion that he would and could have saved every man lost at Gettysburg. It was still later that Longstreet wrote that Lee was excited and off his balance at Gettysburg and labored under that oppression until enough blood was shed to appease him. Since the publication of the official reports and of the narratives of the leading Confederate participants has shown the full measure of Longstreet's sulking, it has often been asked why Lee did not arrest him for insubordination or order him before a court-martial. The answer is quite simple, when Lee said, it is all my fault, he meant exactly what he said. He undoubtedly considered himself to blame for the result. He was in command. If his orders were obeyed, the fault was with his plan, if his orders were not obeyed he was culpable for permitting them to be disregarded, so he must have reasoned. Even if this had not been his feeling he still would not have rid himself of Longstreet, for the simple reason that he had no one with whom to replace him. Grave as were Longstreet's faults, and costly as his peculiarities proved to be at Gettysburg, he was Lee's most experienced lieutenant and, after Jackson's death, the ablest, once he could be induced to go into action. Had he been removed, any successor than available would have disclosed other faults perhaps more serious.
Li displayed not the slightest difference in his manner toward Longstreet after the campaign, he was as friendly as ever and, as always, determined to make the best of his subordinates' idiosyncrasies. Lee made little comment on Gettysburg during the war. In talking with General Haight, who was one of the few generals in the army whom he called by his first name, Lee expressed conviction that the invasion of Pennsylvania was sound policy and said that he would again enter that state if able to do so. He also remarked to Haight, when the dicta of the armchair strategists were under discussion, after it is all over, as stupid a fellow as I am can see the mistakes that were made. I notice, however, that my mistakes are never told me until it is too late, and you, and all my officers, know that I am always ready and anxious to have their suggestions. When the war had ended, General Lee was still reticent in writing and speaking to strangers about Gettysburg or about any other of his battles, and never went further than to say to them that if the assault could have been coordinated success could have been attained. In conversation with close friends, he would sometimes be more communicative. In April, 1868, he discussed with Colonel William Allen the invasion of Pennsylvania, explained in some detail his reasons for taking the offensive, and then, according to Allen's contemporaneous memorandum, went on. Heath Lee found himself engaged with the Federal Army, unexpectedly, and had to fight. This being decided on, victory would have been won if he could have gotten one decided simultaneous attack on the whole line. This he tried his utmost to effect for three days, and failed. Ewell he could not get to act with decision. Rhodes, Early, Johnson, attacked, and were hurt in detail. Longstreet, Hill, etc., could not be gotten to act in concert. Thus the federal troops were enabled to be opposed to each of our corps, or even divisions, in succession. As it was, however, he inflicted more damage than he received, and he broke up the federal summer campaign. Discussing the battle with Governor John Lee Carroll of Maryland, Lee is quoted, though at secondhand, as saying that the battle would have been gained if General Longstreet had obeyed the orders given him and had made the attack early instead of late. Lee was also credited with saying in the same conversation, General Longstreet, when once in a fight, was a most brilliant soldier, but he was the hardest man to move I had in my army. The literal accuracy of various parts of these statements may be questioned, but it is certain that in the last years at Lexington, as Lee viewed the Gettysburg campaign in some perspective, he concluded that it was the absence of Jackson, not the presence of Ewell or of Longstreet, that made the Army of Northern Virginia a far less effective fighting machine at Gettysburg than at Chancellorsville. Not long before his death, in a long conversation with his cousin Cassius Lee of Alexandria, the general said that if Jackson had been at Gettysburg he would have held the heights that Ewell seized. And one afternoon, when he was out riding with Professor White, he said quietly, if I had had Stonewall Jackson with me, so far as man can see, I should have won the Battle of Gettysburg. That statement must stand. The darkest scene in the great drama of Gettysburg was enacted at Chancellorsville when Jackson fell. Chapter 10. Can the offensive be resumed? Bristow Station. We must now prepare for harder blows and harder work. In that spirit, Lee faced the enemy after his return to Virginia. Unchanged in bearing or in determination as far as anyone could see, he wrestled again with the food shortage that had been one of the chief reasons for the invasion of Pennsylvania. Weakened by 23,000 men, he was back in a devastated country and was forced to rely once again on Northrop for the army's food. Because of this, he realized that he might be compelled to retreat nearer to Richmond, but he was not willing to relinquish the initiative to General Meade if he could take it himself. For he still held that the offensive defensive was the true strategic policy of the South, even if prolonged invasion of the North was impossible. As soon as the army settled down on the Rapidan, Lee undertook from his headquarters on the fine plantation of Erasmus Taylor to bring the army up to offensive strength again. His first results were encouraging. The return of stragglers and of lightly wounded and the arrival of 3,000 men loaned him temporarily from the army of Major General Samuel Jones raised Lee's effective strength to 58,000 by August 10, for all of whom the resourceful Colonel Gorgas soon provided arms to replace those lost at Gettysburg and on the retreat. Although there were among the conscripts further desertions that Lee sought vigorously to check, rest continued to raise the morale of the troops. But the limitations of manpower were soon apparent.
Mr. Davis had to admit that he saw no prospect of increasing the army to its former strength, the soldiers were almost barefooted, the supply of rations was menacingly short, the railroads were scarcely able to haul what the commissaries found, the equipment of the cavalry was in embarrassing disrepair and the horses received so little grain that they recovered slowly. Soon Jones's troops had to be ordered back to him, and the ranks were further reduced by a series of furloughs Lee thought it prudent to grant. The inflow of conscripts and of returning wounded did little more than offset this. The end of August found the army stronger by only 2,600 than it had been on the 10th. Thus circumstanced, Lee could not take the offensive, though he hoped soon to be able to do so. Nor was it certain that a march against Meade was the best contribution the Army of Northern Virginia could make at the time to the general strategy of the South. On August 24, at a time when there were some indications of a possible advance by the enemy, President Davis asked Lee to come to Richmond to discuss with him a new and menacing situation, in the development of which he had greatly missed Lee's counsel. Lee left Longstreet in charge and went immediately to the capital, where he remained with one or two days' intermission until September 7. He discussed with the president the means of preventing desertion and of procuring more corn for the animals attached to the army, and he had to advise on a large and critical problem of general strategy. The strong army with which Grant had captured Vicksburg, while holding off Johnston, was being unwisely dispersed by the federal administration and gave no immediate concern, but in Tennessee, where conditions had been fairly stable for many months, the enemy under Rosecrans had forced Bragg in July to abandon Tullahoma and to fall back on Chattanooga. That able federal commander was now maneuvering to force his opponent from the city. Buckner was facing Burnside at Knoxville, with every prospect that the Confederates would be compelled to evacuate that place, also. If Knoxville and Chattanooga were yielded up, the Confederates would lose the most direct line of communication between Virginia and the Mississippi Valley. That was not all. When Vicksburg had surrendered, the Confederacy had been cut in half. If the enemy were to follow this by breaking Bragg's front and marching through Georgia, the eastern half of the Southern Republic would itself be split in twain, and nothing would be left the government at Richmond except the two Carolinas and that part of Virginia below the Rappahannock, a fragment that could not long survive. Even this area was threatened, not only from the north, but from the coast as well. Charleston, S.C., was under formal siege. Battery Wagner had fallen, Fort Sumter was a mass of defiant ruins, the city had been bombarded. The federal blockade had tightened everywhere. At Wilmington alone did the fast British merchantmen find a ready port for the munitions shipped to the Confederate government, and at Wilmington there was a menace of land operations that would flank the defenses of Cape Fear River. In this crisis, the darkest the embattled South had yet known, what course held out the strongest promise of relief? That was the question President Davis discussed in long, private conferences with the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, whose strict conception of the subordination of the military arm to the civil government kept him from offering suggestions regarding other armies than his own, except when his views were sought by the President or by the Secretary of War. Lee did not believe the danger to Wilmington imminent enough to justify the government in weakening its scanty forces elsewhere. Charleston he trusted the enemy would never get, though he found the administration apprehensive of its safety and anxious to send troops there to strengthen General Beauregard. The main choice, as Lee saw it, then, lay between attacking Meade and attacking Rosecrans. Which should be done? As Bragg could not take the offensive without additional troops, should he give ground or should he be reinforced from the Army of Northern Virginia, with all the consequent risks to Richmond? Longstreet had long been anxious to go to Tennessee and to cooperate in an attempt to drive Rosecrans from that state, Lee's inclination was to assume the offensive against Meade. The president, it seems, at first leaned so strongly to this view that Lee ordered the army to be made ready for an advance, on the assurance of the quartermaster general that sufficient corn would be forthcoming for the horses. On September 2, however, the Federals entered Knoxville, the enemy's movement against Chattanooga developed, and the situation became so alarming that Davis concluded he must reinforce both Beauregard and Bragg from the Army of Northern Virginia. With some misgivings but, as Davis has recorded, with commendable zeal for the public welfare and characteristic self-denial, Lee acquiesced in the movement of two brigades to Charleston, S.C., and in the dispatch of the rest of one corps to Tennessee. The president was anxious that Lee assume command on that front himself, but left the question open while Lee hurried back to the Rapidan on September 7 to prepare the troops for movement.
Lee had decided to designate the 1st Corps, Les Pickett's division, for the adventure in the West, and as he found Longstreet most anxious to go, he was confirmed in his opinion that it would be best to remain personally in Virginia to detach Longstreet and to leave the direction of affairs in Tennessee to officers familiar with the troops. The plan was that Longstreet should proceed by way of the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad to the vicinity of Chattanooga, join with Bragg in an attack on Rosecrans, and return promptly to the Army of Northern Virginia. The troop movement was to be made as quietly as possible and Longstreet's destination was to be kept a secret. Believing that Rosecrans was maneuvering to effect the evacuation of Chattanooga, as in reality he was, Lee urged that he be attacked without delay. Within 24 hours after he reached Orange, Lee had McClaws's and Hood's divisions of Longstreet's famous veterans on the road. Pickett was to follow. When Longstreet came to headquarters to say farewell, Lee bade him Godspeed. Now, General, he said, you must beat those people out in the West. If I live, Longstreet quotes himself as having answered, but I would not give a single man of my command for a fruitless victory. Lee assured him, in parting, that the president was prepared to follow up a success, and as Longstreet rode off, Lee turned back to his own problem. He was left to direct an army that was now reduced to 46,000 officers and men, an army that seemed strangely different without the familiar divisions of the First Corps. Fortunately, everything had been quiet during Lee's absence in Richmond except for the escape of General Avril after a mischievous raid in western Virginia. Partly because the men were at leisure, and partly to remind them that the Army of Northern Virginia still had might, Lee staged a picturesque review of the II Corps on September 9 and one of Hill's troops two days later. As on the historic eve of the Battle of Brandy Station, he rode the full length of the line and then, surrounded by his staff officers and a company of ladies, he watched the men march past. By their steady and firm step and soldierly bearing, one participant recorded, they showed that they were not disheartened, but ready to go wherever their trusted and beloved commander might point the way. Despite the stimulation of these reviews, the course of events in Tennessee made Lee fear that Longstreet might not arrive in time to be of help. Before the First Corps reached Richmond news came that Bragg had been forced to evacuate Chattanooga and had retreated to the Chickamauga River. The same day, September 9, a powerful federal column compelled the capitulation of the Confederate troops holding Cumberland Gap where the Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee borders meet. This closed the Virginia-Tennessee Railroad and necessitated the movement of Longstreet's Corps by the difficult route through Atlanta. There were, besides, vexatious discussions as to the particular units Longstreet should take with him. At length he set out from Richmond, with affectionate assurance to Lee that if he could nothing in Tennessee, he would ask to be sent back to Virginia. Longstreet was confident enough and expectant of new honors, for there were broad hints from the War Department that he would be named to succeed Bragg, but Lee was apprehensive, especially as the news of the transfer of the Corps, which was to have been a military secret, became generally known, to his deep disgust. Lee could only urge speed and greater speed in attacking Rosecrans. There were reasons for concern, also, on the line of the Rapidan. The activity of the Federal Cavalry indicated that an attack might be brewing. General Sam Jones, alarmed by the capture of Cumberland Gap, began to call on Lee for reinforcements. Deliberately keeping up a bold front, Lee sent back all his surplus supplies to Gordonsville in anticipation of an enforced withdrawal. He had already cautioned Davis to strengthen the Richmond fortifications and to expedite the erection of arsenals farther inland. Similarly, he advocated haste in the completion of the railroad that was to link Danville, Virginia, with Greensboro, N.C. With the Virginia and Tennessee already severed and the enemy threatening the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad, a new line of rail communication was necessary. Otherwise, the Army of Northern Virginia might no longer be able to draw supplies from the south and that would mean ruin. Then, in a dark hour, the telegraph clicked off the announcement, as glorious as it was unexpected, that Bragg with Longstreet's help had struck Rosecrans at Chickamauga on September 1920 and had thrown him in retreat on Chattanooga. A new crisis had been passed. Hope rose in every southern heart. If the victory could be followed up, the whole gloomy prospect of the war might be transformed. Lee immediately announced the success to his troops and wrote his warm congratulations to Longstreet. My whole heart and soul, he said, have been with you and your brave corps in your late battle. 
It was natural to hear of Longstreet and D.H. Hill charging side by side, and pleasing to find the armies of the East and West vying with each other in valor and devotion to their country. A complete and glorious victory must ensue under such circumstances. Finish the work before you, my dear General, and return to me. I want you badly, and you cannot get back too soon. But after Gettysburg and Vicksburg, fortune's smiles on the South always quickly turned to frowns. Jubilation over Chickamauga lasted only a few days. Then it was found that what had happened so often in Virginia had been repeated in the West, the Army of Tennessee had exhausted itself in winning a battle and did not follow up its success. Rosecrans withdrew in safety to Chattanooga, and the Confederates were slow to follow. Disquieting reports arrived of friction between the dyspeptic Bragg and his high-spirited subordinates. Longstreet's self-confidence began to evaporate, and he called loudly for the leadership of which he was later so critical in his review of Gettysburg. Can't you send us General Lee? he pleaded with the Secretary of War. We need some such great mind as General Lee's. General Leonidas Polk wrote directly to Lee, asking him to come west and reap the fruits of victory. Lee was a long time in receiving this letter and then tactfully avoided a criticism of Bragg, but he was conscious of the shortcomings of that officer and fearful that he would lose his advantage by laying siege to Chattanooga. His own view was that Bragg should cross the Tennessee River below the town, attack Rosecrans's communications, and compel a retreat. While Bragg's movements were still in doubt, Lee received reports from spies on September 28 that the 11 and 12 Corps of the Army of the Potomac had been withdrawn and had been sent to reinforce Rosecrans. The time of the departure of the two Corps was given as of September 25, but Meade's army still appeared so strong that it was October 1 before Lee was satisfied that Meade had been forced to part with these units. Meantime, however, Lee notified the president of the suspected movement and urged that Bragg act before the reinforcements reached his adversary. Until he learned that the Federals were weakened, Lee had been bluffing Meade, while himself expecting an attack, and he had been scouring Virginia for reinforcements. Now that the odds against him had been reduced, as he thought, by about 12,000, Lee began to consider the advisability of seizing the initiative once more. There were ample arguments against such a course. The ranks were thin and the men were poorly clad and were shod. Lee himself was far from well. About September 20th he began to have violent pains in the back which were attributed at various times to lumbago, to sciatica, or to rheumatism. Although they were not so diagnosed, they probably were the first positive symptoms of angina pectoris, the results of the strains of the summer on a heart weakened by his illness in the spring. In the light of his experience at Gettysburg with the defects of the reorganized army, it was dangerous for him to take the field in poor physical condition because he might be called upon to direct operations in person. But there were strong reasons why, in his opinion, an advance was desirable even though the nights already were chilly and the forests along the Rapidan were flying the warning colors of approaching winter. A movement against Meade would certainly prevent the detachment of additional troops to the west. That was the all-important consideration. If, furthermore, Meade could be driven back to the Potomac and held there during the winter, Northern Virginia would be spared the distresses of federal occupation, the railroads would be more nearly safe from raiders, and the campaign of 1864 would open where Lee would have ample ground for maneuver without exposing Richmond. As the condition of the horses was somewhat improved, his belief in the strategic wisdom of an offensive defensive led him once again to take risks for the sake of possible gains. The leaks from Richmond during Longstreet's southward movement prompted Lee to proceed with much secrecy in making his plans. Apparently he did not even notify the president of his intentions, though the fact that he would advance and the probable time of his start were known even to clerks in the War Department. Meade was north of Culpeper on a ridge that would serve as well for defense as for attack and had two corps extended to the Rapidan. In this position the enemy could not be assailed to advantage by a frontal attack. Hence, Lee determined to maneuver him from his position and to thrust at him when he found a favorable opening. This would necessitate a roundabout march, at a distance from the enemy, if the movement was to be a surprise. To cover his advance, Lee directed General Imboden to move up the Shenandoah Valley and to protect the flank of the army by occupying the mountain passes. Then Lee divided his cavalry, which had been reorganized into two divisions under Wade Hampton and Fitz Lee, respectively.
Fitz Lee was to remain on the Rapidan to cover the army's rear until Meade retreated. Hampton's division, led by Stuart, was to move on the right of the column. Supplies were to be sent up the Orange and Alexandria Railroad to Culpeper as soon as the road was opened by Meade's withdrawal. When the time for the advance arrived, Lee's rheumatism in the back was so severe that he could not mount a horse, but he determined not to delay operations on that account. The two corps of Ewell and Hill crossed the upper Rapidan on October 9 and made their way through the hills toward Madison Courthouse, which was reached on the 10th. The appearance of federal cavalry in front of Stuart that day showed that the movement had been discovered and that Lee could not hope to catch Meade off his guard. Lee, who was riding in a wagon, was not surprised when Union Horse was encountered because an injudicious announcement that he would cross the Rapidan had appeared in one of the Richmond newspapers. Stuart easily disposed of the prying cavalry outposts on October 10 and cleared the road for the advance of the infantry toward Culpeper on the 11th. When the army reached Stonehouse Mountain, five miles from that town, Lee learned that Meade had evacuated his position and had put the Rappahannock between him and his pursuers. All his stores had either been removed or destroyed. It was necessary, therefore, to undertake a new turning movement to reach the Federals. Before this could be started the army had to be rationed, a process that had to wait on the arrival of the railroad trains, because the country, stripped bare by the invaders, could furnish nothing. While the hungry columns rested by the roadside, Lee rode into Culpeper. His back was better and he could keep on his horse, though every motion gave him pain. When he reached the town, the old men, the cripples, the women and the children turned out to greet him. As they thronged about him, one petticoat superpatriot informed the general that during the occupation of the place by the enemy certain young ladies of Culpeper had gone to General Sedgwick's headquarters and had been entertained there with band music, Yankee band music. Some of those who were accused of this act of near treason were in the crowd, and while they doubtless would have been glad to scratch out the eyes of the informer, they trembled as Lee put on an air of mock severity. He teased them with a dark look for a moment and then he said, I know General Sedgwick very well. It is just like him to be so kindly and considerate and to have his band there to entertain them. So, young ladies, if the music is good, go and hear it as often as you can and enjoy yourself. You will find that General Sedgwick will have none but agreeable gentlemen about him. That settled it, youth was vindicated. The fate of the super patriot, after Lee's departure, is not in the record. Meantime, on the 11th, the cavalrymen were having a most exciting day. Stuart had flushed the Federal horse early in the morning and had been pursuing with his wanted dash. Every few hours he sent back to Lee to report his situation, for he had learned his lesson in Pennsylvania and did not intend to permit himself to get out of touch with the commanding general again. Late in the afternoon, when Lee had left Culpeper and had established camp for the night on the road near the village of Griffinsburg, one of Stuart's staff officers rode up with the news that Fitz Lee had encountered federal cavalry units and was driving them northward from the line of the Rapidan in the direction of Brandy Station, while Stuart himself was pressing another column back toward the Rappahannock. General Lee was with Ewell when this message arrived, and he received it, said the officer who brought the report, with that grave courtesy which he exhibited alike toward the highest and the lowest soldier in his army. Thank you, he said. Tell General Stewart to continue to press them back toward the river. Then he smiled and added, but tell him, too, to spare his horses, to spare his horses. It is not necessary to send so many messages. Turning to Ewell, he said of the staff officer and of another who had preceded him only a few minutes, I think these two gentlemen make eight messengers sent me by General Stewart. Stewart, in obedience to this kindly hint, may have spared his horses in sending more reports to Lee, but he did not withhold the spur in following the enemy. True to his expectation, Fitz Lee joined him near the scene of their famous cavalry action of June 9, and together they fought a second battle of Brandy Station, almost as interesting as the first because of the soldierly coordination of horse artillery, cavalry, sharpshooters, and dismounted cavalry. By nightfall, they had driven the enemy over the Rappahannock. Lee's task on the morning of October 12 was to outflank Meade and to intercept him on his retreat up the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. In its essentials, the problem was analogous to the one he had solved successfully 14 months previously by sending Jackson around Pope's rear.
Now, however, he could not hope to repeat this maneuver on a large scale because of the weakness of the army and of the transport, but he was willing to undertake a shorter turning movement in the hope of forcing Meade into a position where the Federals could be attacked advantageously. The only roads available to Lee for this purpose led to Warrington, so he chose that town as his immediate objective. Dividing the army into columns of corps, Lee set out from the vicinity of Culpeper early on the morning of October 12, his front and right flank covered by Stuart's cavalry. Ewell's corps was to move by way of Jeffersonton and Sulphur Springs. Hill was to take the longer, better protected route via Woodville, Sperryville, Washington, Amisville, and Waterloo Bridge, a winding way, but one for which there was no substitute. While the cavalry skirmished on a wide front with the enemy, Ewell's infantry, which Lee accompanied in person, marched undisturbed by Rixieville to Jeffersonton. Although thousands of men were barefooted, they did not complain or straggle. With their faces to the north, they were as confident as ever. As the column approached Jeffersonton, the village where Lee had given Jackson his orders for the march around Pope, the cavalry encountered a federal outpost scattered behind hills, fences, and the wall of the cemetery. The 11th Virginia was dismounted and was sent forward, but it was not strong enough for the task. Lee thereupon ordered Stuart to deploy a regiment on either side of Jeffersonton and to force the enemy out. In a few minutes there was a sharp clash, then the Federals gave way and scattered, with Stuart's men hunting them down in fast pursuit. From Jeffersonton the Warrenton Road turns to the northeast, crosses a ridge and descends to the valley of the Upper Rappahannock at Warrenton Sulphur Springs, the scene of Early's anxious adventure that August night in 1862 when the rising waters cut him off on the left bank of the stream from the supporting troops of Jackson. When the advance reached the familiar ground around the ford, it discovered the enemy on guard, with dismounted cavalry in rifle pits and with some artillery in position. Stuart at once advanced his own dismounted men, and Lee's former military secretary, General A. L. Long, brought up a battery from the 2nd Corps artillery, of which he was now chief. The Federal gunners were quickly driven off, but when the 12th Virginia Cavalry rode up to the bridge, it found the planking removed and came under a hot fire from sharpshooters. Without hesitating, the 12th turned about, made its way to the ford below the bridge, and dashed across. The Federal rearguard at once withdrew, the cavalrymen replaced the planking, and two divisions of infantry, passing quickly over, once again stood north of the Rappahannock. It was now nearly dark, and Lee called a halt. Early on the morning of October 13, the remaining troops of Ewell's Corps crossed at Sulphur Springs and moved on Warrenton. Their march was not rapid, because Lee knew that Hill had a longer route to pursue, and he did not desire to be in the presence of the enemy until the two corps were reunited. It was afternoon when he reached Warrenton, where Hill joined him about dark, too late to undertake a farther advance that day, especially as the entire army had to be rationed from the wagon train, now that Lee no longer was in touch with the railroad. During the day Lee had received messages from Stuart through Fitz Lee announcing that enemy troops were still at Warrenton Junction but were burning stores. Before nightfall a courier arrived with a dispatch, dated 3.45 p.m., in which Stuart stated that a federal wagon train was moving from Warrenton Junction as a following infantry toward Warrenton. Stuart's note indicated that he was close to the enemy. He said, in particular, that he would dispatch further information very soon, as one of his officers was making a reconnaissance at that moment. Then, curiously enough, the flow of messages stopped. As the day ended and the troops went into bivouac around Warrenton, Lee became apprehensive and waited long after his usual hour of retirement for further news. Had Stuart been cut off? Was the enemy approaching Warrenton? About one o'clock a staff officer came to Lee's tent and announced that a spy in Stuart's service, good by name, had arrived with a strange tale. Lee went out to the campfire to hear what the man had to report. Good was much concerned, Stuart, he said, had found the enemy moving northward along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and had started back with two brigades of cavalry toward Auburn, on the way to Warrington. As Stuart had approached Auburn he had discovered another heavy federal column moving northward past Auburn toward Greenwich. Stuart had taken his men out of the road and had hidden them in a wood behind a hill north of Catlett Station Auburn-Warrenton Road, but he was between two forces of the enemy and might be discovered at any time.
he had sent Good to inform General Lee of his plight and to ask that a force be sent to make an artillery demonstration west of the Auburn Greenwich Road. If this were done, Stuart might open with his own artillery and create so much consternation among the Federals that he could effect his escape. On the map, Good pointed out the situation as follows. Lee went back into his tent to consider what had best be done to relieve Stuart. While there he could plainly hear Good's voice as the spy chatted with staff officers around the campfire. There was a standing order in the army against the discussion of confidential matters by spies with anyone but the officer to whom they were sent. Good's apparent disdain of this very necessary regulation angered Lee. Going to the door of the tent he said in a loud, wrathful voice that he did not want his scouts to be talking in camp. Scarcely had he turned back when Major Venable entered and told him that Good was fairly trembling at the general's rebuke. The man had not been talking incautiously, Venable said, but had simply been trying to explain where the artillery could be placed to save Stuart from discovery. Lee repented instantly of his stern treatment of the faithful Good. Going out to him, he gave orders that a supper with hot coffee should be prepared for the man, and he was not content with his amends until he had placed Good on his own camp stool in the headquarters mess tent and had seen him well supplied with food. This done, Lee ordered General Ewell to make the desired diversion at dawn and prepared the army for a general advance against Bristow on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. About daylight there came the sound of a brief cannonade from the direction of Ewell's approach, followed quickly by a more distant salvo, evidently from Stuart's guns. Soon Stuart himself rode up to Lee and reported triumphantly that he had broken through the enemy's lines and had escaped with negligible loss. He had spent an anxious night, he said. His troopers had been compelled to remain in the saddle. At the bridle of each animal hitched to the wagons and to the guns, a dismounted cavalryman had stood to stifle every impatient neigh of the horses and each inquisitive bray of the mules. Once, during the long vigil, some of Stuart's officers had proposed that they abandon the guns and the train and cut their way out, but Stuart had refused. His own judgment had forced him to reject another idea with which his imaginative mind had toyed, to move out into the road, to turn the enemy's wagon train westward in the darkness, and to fall in as if the two lean brigades in grey were part of the Federal Army. When daylight had come a fog had obscured the ground, and as soon as he had heard Ewell's guns he had opened with his own batteries against Federal infantry who had leisurely been boiling coffee, in a most tantalizing manner, within sight of the hungry Confederates. Then he had rushed off. From Stewart's report, it was apparent that part of the Army of the Potomac was close at hand, but as the enemy had direct roads there was little prospect that Meade would soon be overtaken. The Army set out for Bristow, however, in high spirits, Hill by way of New Baltimore and Greenwich, Ewell by Auburn and Greenwich. The march was long and the pace was fast. Lee was stirred by the zeal of the men, and when he came to write of the advance, he told the president, I think the sublimest sight of the war was the cheerfulness and alacrity exhibited by this army in the pursuit of the enemy under all the trials and privations to which it was exposed. A North Carolina soldier in Hill's Corps attributed the speed of the march to less lofty motives than pure patriotism. According to him, on reaching Greenwich, we found the campfires of the enemy still burning and evident signs of their departure in haste. Guns, knapsacks, blankets, etc., strewn along the road showed that the enemy was moving in rapid retreat, and prisoners sent in every few minutes confirmed our opinion that they were fleeing in haste. It was almost like boys chasing a hare. Though the march was very rapid, not a straggler left the ranks of our regiment, every man seeming in earnest and confident in the belief, then he admitted the real reason, that we would soon overtake and capture a portion of the Federal Army before us with their wagon trains. Shoes for bare feet, blankets for shivering shoulders, sutlers' delicacies for hungry stomachs, these were the spurs that hurried the regiments on. At Greenwich, Ewell gave Hill the direct road to Bristow Station, and as he was familiar from boyhood with the ground, he conducted his own corps forward by farm roads a mile and more to the right of Hill's line of advance. Lee rode with Ewell at the head of the Second Corps, accompanied by General Pendleton. About mid-afternoon, as he approached the railroad, Lee was greeted with a heavy outburst of firing on the left, infantry and artillery, Hill evidently engaged hotly with the enemy. Proceeding at once across country to ascertain the nature of the engagement, Lee did not arrive until the action was over. Then he learned the grim details of as badly managed a battle as had ever been fought under the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia.
This is what happened as his corps approached Bristow Station, where Jackson had reached the Orange and Alexandria Railroad in August 1862. A. P. Hill observed a large force of the enemy on the near side and many more troops on the far side of Broad Run, a fordable little stream that courses from north to south until it reaches the railway and then turns to the east. As Hill's advance was from the west, the stretch of Broad Run above the railroad was almost directly in his front. He accordingly deployed Haight's division facing the stream with the intention of crossing at once and pursuing the enemy. Only two brigades had been put in position, Cook's on the right and Kirkland's on the left, when they received orders to attack immediately. The enemy across the run was moving hurriedly off at the time and Polk's battalion was being advanced to shell the column. Just as Cook started forward, a sharp fire broke out on his right from the direction of the railroad cut which ran from southwest to northeast. Throwing forward two companies to feel out the enemy, Cook halted and sent word to Haight of his predicament, but as Anderson's division was coming up, Hill felt that he could repulse any troops on Haight's flank, and he sent peremptory orders for Cook to advance at once across the run, whither all the Federals in sight had now fled. Well, said Cook, who had shown his fiber when he had stood almost unsupported at Sharpsburg, I will advance, and if they flank me, I will face my men about and cut my way out. Scarcely had he started than the whole of the railroad embankment on his right began to blaze with musketry. The embankment formed an ideal breastwork and behind it, on rising ground, federal artillery was soon visible. Then it dawned on the Confederates that while they had been intent on pursuing the troops across the run, another federal force had advanced up the railroad and had taken position where it could sweep Haight's flank. It was as fine a trap as could have been devised by a month's engineering. Cook's brigade, of course, could do nothing but retreat forthwith or else pivot on its right and attack the enemy behind the railway embankment. As Cook was badly wounded, almost at the first fire, his senior colonel made a quick choice and ordered the charge. Kirkland conformed, swung his left around, and made for the enemy in the cut. He, too, was wounded, but his men kept on. They reached the embankment and plunged over it, only to be driven back speedily or captured. Cook's men gallantly approached the embankment but came under a heavy enfilade and failed to reach their objective. The two brigades fell back and in doing so uncovered a Confederate battery that had been placed, unknown to them, on the right of the road in rear of Cook. The enemy promptly advanced and seized four of the guns, which he hauled off. Walker's brigade, which had gone across the run, made a quick return and attempted to recover the lost artillery, but it was too late. Within forty minutes, before Anderson's division could get in position on Haight's right and ere the Second Corps reached the field of action, the battle was ended and night was falling. Two Confederate corps had been within striking distance and so disposed that if Hill's attack had been delayed even half an hour, the Federals moving along the railroad could have been roughly handled and perhaps cut off. As it was, two brigades had borne the brunt of the action. Both had been wrecked. Cook's fine regiments had lost 700 and Kirkland's 602. In the 27th North Carolina, which had been most severely exposed to direct and to enfilading fire, the casualties numbered 290 in an effective strength of 416 and all except three of the 36 officers were killed, wounded, or captured. The total losses reached 1361. The army was indignant. There was no earthly excuse for it, Colonel Walter Taylor protested, as all our troops were well in hand, and much stronger than the enemy. Said Sloan, a worse managed affair than this fight, did not take place during the war. When the reports reached President Davis, he endorsed on Hills, there was a want of vigilance. Lee said little, but the next morning, when he went over the ground and listened as Hill sorrowfully told his story and manfully took all the blame upon himself, his look was glum and disappointed, and he silenced Hill with words that were, for him, the worst of rebukes, well, well, General, bury these poor men and let us say no more about it. During that same morning of October 15, the cavalry reported that the enemy had retreated beyond Bull Run and was entrenching there. Should Lee follow? He was confident that if he did so he could turn Meade's position and either force him north of the Potomac or compel him to take refuge in the fortifications around Washington. But the army, of course, was not strong enough to besiege Washington, and if it attempted to hold Meade on the Potomac or close to that stream, it would be compelled either to march into Loudoun or draw a line close to Bull Run.
There was perhaps enough food in Loudoun to supply the army temporarily, but the roads into that country were rough with stones, and the October nights would be cold. The quartermaster's corps had not issued enough shoes before the advance. The men's footgear was in wretched condition. If he could avoid the necessity, Lee was anxious to save his soldiers from new hardships. Besides, a move farther northward would carry the army to such a distance from Richmond that it could not be available in case the Confederate capital were attacked from the east. Remaining where he was, in front of Manassas Junction, seemed to Lee as difficult as advancing into Loudoun, except for the exposure of the troops. He could draw no provisions from the naked country roundabout, and though he was on the railroad, it could not supply him. Meade had destroyed the bridge over the Rappahannock and had blown up one of its piers. This could not be repaired in time to serve the army. Everything would have to be hauled by wagon from the rail end on the south side of the river. Were the possible benefits worth these risks and hardships? Lee was disposed to answer in the negative, but while he was debating, he began the destruction of the railroad in order that Meade could not utilize it in pursuing the army back to the Rappahannock. For this work of tearing up the railway, Lee employed, among other troops, Lane's North Carolina Brigade, which had long specialized in this art under the tutelage of Stonewall Jackson. The rails were first attached from the cross ties. Then the ties were dug from the roadbed and were piled in square pens at convenient intervals. Thereupon the rails were placed on top the pens, which were then set afire. When the center of the rails became red-hot and the ends began to sag, soldiers would take the rails, run with them to the nearest tree, post, or telegraph pole, and quickly wind them around the upright. The rails thus twisted were called iron necties and, of course, could not be relayed. This work, begun on the 15th, was continued the next day, while wrecking detachments destroyed the nearby bridges. On the 16th a heavy autumnal rain saturated the ground and swelled the streams. The army could hardly have moved had Lee desired it to do so, and had he found it necessary to put the shivering men on the march, Lee could not have led them, for his condition, which was now pronounced lumbago, was so painful that he was confined to his tent. Satisfied on the 17th that he could accomplish little by staying in Meade's front, Lee started the army back toward the Rappahannock on October 18th and left the cavalry to watch the enemy. He was not certain how soon Meade might attempt to follow him and, to retard the enemy, he continued to destroy the railroad southward until he reached a point from which he believed it would be possible to transport the much-needed rails to the south bank. The march was depressing because of the devastation of the country. Never, wrote Walter Taylor, have I witnessed as sad a picture as Prince William County now presents. Tis desolation made desolate indeed. As far as the eye can reach on every side, there is one vast, barren wilderness, not a fence, not an acre cultivated, not a living object visible, and but for here and there a standing chimney, on the ruins of what was once a handsome and happy home, one would imagine that man was never here and that the country was an entirely new one and without any virtue save its vast extent. Not a living thing, another officer exclaimed, save a few partridges and other small birds. No horse or cow, no hog or sheep, no dog or cat, of course, no man, woman, or child. By noon of the 18th the army reached the Rappahannock, for its march was swift, but because of the slowness of the engineers, the pontoon was not ready, and the tired columns had to wait. Seeing near the river a farmhouse that had been spared, probably because some federal commander had maintained his headquarters there, Lee rode up to look at it. He was shocked at the deliberate vandalism he beheld there. Not a soul remained, the faithful Pendleton chronicled. Drills, however, and plows of most valuable kinds had been piled together in the yard by the Yankees and burned, wagons, carts, and an elegant carriage had been cut to pieces and smashed up with axes, and the Negro cabins were in general reduced to ashes. At length the pontoons were in place, the bridge was laid, and Lee crossed to the south bank with half the army. The other forces followed the next morning. The whole movement was completed without interruption, except for the action that won the alluring name of the Buckland Races. This affair was on October 19. The Confederate cavalry, which had been on picket duty in the vicinity of Bull Run, had fallen back in two columns, one toward Warrenton under Stuart and the other toward Bristow under Fitzlee. Stuart made a stand on Broad Run in the vicinity of Buckland and was holding off the enemy when he received a dispatch from Fitzlee stating that he was on his way to support Stuart, 
If Stewart fell back down the Warrenton Road, Fitzlee said he could himself assail the Federals' flank and perhaps rout them. Stewart promptly retired until he reached Chestnut Hill, about two and a half miles above Warrenton. Hearing then the guns of Fitz Lee, he turned on Kilpatrick's cavalry, who correctly assumed they were in a trap and retreated in great haste, pursued by Stuart. Not until Buckland was reached did Stuart halt the chase. The fact that fleeing Federals and following Confederates were so close together on the stretch of seven miles gave the contest the nature of a race. Hence, the name bestowed on the action. Lee was much pleased with the affair, which yielded prisoners and much booty, but he promptly forbade Stuart to undertake a raid to the Potomac during the temporary demoralization of the enemy. While the Buckland races gave a saving touch of humor to the withdrawal, they did not relieve the expedition of failure. Lee had asked, in effect, whether the offensive could be resumed, and the answer, all too plain, was that it could not be with the limited forces he had, and with his material as poor as it then was. If he could get more men, or even more shoes and feed for his horses, it might be different, but without these, for hunger or for plenty, for worse or for better, the Army of Northern Virginia must remain temporarily on the defensive, in a stricken land. Chapter 11 A Surprise and a Disappointment Rappahannock Bridge and Mine Run Back on the south side of the Rappahannock, the Army of Northern Virginia, which had been in good spirits during the Bristow expedition, was satisfied that the year's bitter fighting had at last been ended. Meade was somewhat of the same mind. He believed that Lee had advanced to Bristow Station in order to destroy the railroad and thereby to hold off the Army of the Potomac while he sent more troops to Tennessee, a deep game, Meade said, and I am free to admit that in the playing of it, Lee has got the advantage of me. But Lee was not so sure that all was over for the winter. He presumed that Meade would advance again. If I could only get some shoes and clothes for the men, he said, I would save him the trouble. On the possibility that supplies might be forthcoming for a limited offensive, he kept his pontoons on the Rappahannock, close to the piers of the old railroad bridge at Rappahannock Station. Simultaneously, he fortified a bridgehead on the north bank of the river. In doing this, he had a defensive as well as an offensive object in view, for as long as he was able to maintain the pontoon bridge he would be in position to divide Meade's forces and could throw a flanking column over the river in case his adversary attempted to cross the Rappahannock either above or below him. Two weeks and more passed without important incident. The Army of the Potomac advanced to Warrenton, halted there for some days, and then began to feel its way slowly toward the Rappahannock, but Meade did not appear to threaten a general advance. During the respite thus afforded him, Lee experienced some concern over the unsatisfactory handling of affairs in western Virginia. There was, too, the usual futile effort to get reinforcements, especially of cavalry, and some correspondence passed with the War Department over a proposed transfer of troops to South Carolina, a movement against which Lee protested with the reminder that it is only by the concentration of our troops that we can hope to win any decided advantage. For the rest, Lee was content to give the men a vacation from marching and to remain at headquarters near Brandy Station as quietly as was possible, for he was in constant pain and for five days at the beginning of November was unable to ride. He had set November 5 for a review of the Cavalry Corps and had invited Governor John Letcher to witness it, but he was afraid he would not be able to endure this ordeal. Fortunately, though, he felt better that day and was able to participate in a ceremony that delighted the spectators and made the heart of Stuart proud. Several of Lee's nephews and his youngest son were among those passing in front of the commander, who had a secret parental delight in noting that Rooney's old regiment, the 9th Virginia, made the finest showing. Ever since the famous review of June 8, 1863, on that same historic field near Brandy Station, there had been a tradition in the army that pageantry was always followed by action. Once again this was vindicated. On the very day of the ceremonies the outposts reported the enemy advancing to the Rappahannock, and by noon on November 7, Federal infantry was in front of the Tête de Pont, while a large column was moving to Kelly's Ford. As the ground on the south bank of the river at this ford was somewhat similar to that at Fredericksburg, in that it offered no deep defensive position from which to dispute a crossing, Lee intended to permit Meade to cross and then to attack him in superior force by holding part of the Federal force at Rappahannock Bridge. The Confederate troops were well disposed for this purpose. Ewell's corps extended from Kelly's ford to a point beyond the bridgehead, Hill was on the upper stretches of the river, guarding the fords, and the cavalry covered both flanks.
When, therefore, Lee learned during the afternoon that the enemy had crossed at Kelly's Ford, in front of Rhodes's division, he felt no particular concern. Johnson's division was ordered to reinforce Rhodes, Anderson was brought up close to the left of the railroad to support Early, who commanded the crossing, and the rest of Hill's corps was put on the alert. Early had only Hayes's brigade on the north side of the river, in the works covering the pontoon bridge, and no units resting directly on the south bank, but without waiting for orders he advanced the rest of his division as soon as he heard that the enemy was concentrating in front of the Tete de Pont. Lee overtook Early on his way to the bridge and rode forward with him to a hill overlooking the position on the north bank. Early hurried across the pontoon bridge, which was in a protected position, and Lee busied himself with disposing two batteries of artillery that were at hand. After half an hour or more, Early returned and reported that the enemy was gradually approaching the bridgehead under cover of a range of hills, and that the defending force was entirely too small to man the works. On the arrival from the rear of the head of Hoke's command, the leading brigade of Early's division, Lee ordered it over the bridge to support the troops already in position, but he declined to send more men to the north side. He believed that seven regiments would suffice to defend the bridgehead, inasmuch as the enemy could not advance on a longer front than the two brigades held. Soon after Hoke's brigade crossed, the Federals planted artillery where it could deliver a crossfire on the bridgehead. Answering this challenge, the Confederate batteries quickened their fire, and Lee moved up to a hill nearer the river in order that he might observe the fight more closely. He soon discovered that the southern gunners were accomplishing nothing because of the length of the range, and he ordered the fire halted. In a short time dusk fell. A heavy south wind was blowing and carried away from the river the sound of the action. Soon the Federal ordnance ceased its practice. Shortly afterward flashes of musketry could be seen, but these were not long visible. This stoppage of fire convinced Lee that the Federals were merely making a demonstration against the bridgehead, probably to cover their advance at Kelsford, and as the enemy had never made a night attack on a fortified position held by the infantry of the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee concluded that the action in that quarter was over for the day. If the enemy came too close, he believed it would be possible for the troops on the north side to return to the south bank under cover of the batteries. Leaving General Early in charge, Lee rode back to headquarters, where he received the unwelcome news that the enemy had captured parts of two regiments at Kelly's Ford, had laid a pontoon bridge, and had sent a large force over to reinforce the first units. In this situation, of course, the logical course was to carry out the plan previously prepared for this contingency, to hold the bridgehead, to demonstrate there, and to move the greater part of the army eastward to engage the troops that were facing Rhodes and Johnson at Kelly's Ford. But before Lee could execute this plan, Early sent him almost incredible news from the Tête de Pont, after darkness had fallen, the enemy had massed in great strength, had stormed the bridgehead and had captured the whole force on the north side, except for those who had swum the Rappahannock or had run the gauntlet over the pontoon bridge. Fearing an attempted crossing, Early had set fire to the south end of the bridge and had lost the pontoons. Lee's defensive plan collapsed as he read Early's dispatch. If the bridgehead was gone, it would be futile to demonstrate on the left while attacking on the right at Kelly's Ford. Meade would laugh at the helpless southern troops opposite the old railroad bridge. Moreover, the Army of Northern Virginia could not safely remain where it was, on a shallow extended front, with the Rapidan River behind it. Pope had nearly been caught there, with the positions reversed. Lee saw that he must move back, and at once. Within a few hours after Early had reported the disaster at Rappahannock Bridge, the troops had been routed out from their huts, the wagons had been packed, and the army was retiring to a line that crossed the Orange and Alexandria Railroad two miles northeast of Culpeper and barred the road from Kelly's Ford by way of Stevensburg. Lee was, of course, concerned over this hurried movement, but he did not let it upset his poise. As he prepared to leave his headquarters near Brandy Station, he went to Major Taylor's tent and found that officer stretched out in front of a roaring fire. Major Taylor is a happy fellow, he commented cheerfully, and went on his way. There was no sleep for Lee that night, and he was glad to see his faithful staff officer snatching rest while he could. As the army formed line of battle in its new position on the morning of November 9, there was some expectation that Meade would attack, but when he let the day pass without following up his success at Rappahannock Bridge, Lee again put the columns in motion and, on November 10, was back on the south side of the Rapidan, whence he had started one month and one day previously for Bristow Station.
the troops were much chagrined at the necessity which threw them back from the Rappahannock. The affair of the bridge was, Taylor insisted, the saddest chapter in the history of this army, showing miserable, miserable management. Sandy Pendleton, son of the chief of artillery and one of Jackson's former staff officers, was burning for Lee to attack Meade and let us retrieve our lost reputation. He went on, it is absolutely sickening, and I feel personally disgraced by the issue of the late campaign, as does everyone in the command. Oh, how each day is proving the inestimable value of General Jackson to us. A young North Carolinian, less close to the saddles of the mighty, probably voiced the sentiments of the army when he said, I don't know much about it, but it seems to me that our army was surprised. Early was intensely humiliated, though he did not feel himself responsible. Lee called for prompt reports both of the attack at the bridgehead and of the capture of the skirmishers at Kelly's Ford, but when the documents were received he could only say that sharpshooters had not been properly advanced in front of the bridgehead and that Rhodes had erred in placing two regiments on picket duty, instead of one, at Kelly's Ford. The courage and good conduct of the troops engaged, he said, have been too often tried to admit of question. The morale of the army was not impaired by this unhappy affair. The men went cheerfully to work building new huts and contrived to make themselves comfortable after a fashion. Lee sought once more to get shoes for those who were barefooted and began a long correspondence with the commissary bureau concerning the rationing of the army. Supply were so scanty and the operation of the Virginia Central Railroad so uncertain that he was compelled to serve warning that he might be forced to retreat nearer Richmond. As he could not leave the army to go to the capital to discuss these matters with Mr. Davis, he requested the president to visit the army, and, during a period of rainy weather from November 21 to November 24, conferred with him on the situation. Lee's most immediate concern was for the horses, which were almost without forage. He anticipated the loss of many of them from starvation during the winter, and he did not believe that without food they could survive more than two or three days of active operations. The country roundabout had been stripped almost as bare as the devastated area north of the Rappahannock. But whether men or mounts survived or perished, Lee had to guard his front against the powerful, warm, and well-fed enemy that might again descend upon him. A little tributary of Mine Run, known as Walnut Run, 15 miles northeast of Orange Courthouse, was fortified to cover the right flank. Ewell's corps was extended from that point westward to Clark's Mountain, where the old lookout was re-established. In Ewell's absence on account of sickness, this part of the line was entrusted to Early with particular instructions to study the defensive possibilities of Mine Run. From Clark's Mountain westward to Liberty Mills, a distance of approximately 13 miles, Hill's camps were spread. The cavalry covered both flanks, and as Lee thought it probable Meade would make his next advance from Bealton to Ely's and Germana's fords, Hampton's division on the lower Rapidan was enjoined to maintain a ceaseless watch for an advance in that quarter. For more than two weeks after the line of the Rapidan was manned, Meade showed no sign of any disposition to assume the initiative except for minor cavalry demonstrations. Then, on the night of November 24, one of Lee's spies reported that eight days' rations had been issued the I-Corps, and another scout told of suspicious movements by Federal horse in Stafford County. The next morning Stewart's cavalry was put on the alert, and the army became expectant of a new battle. With God's help, wrote Major Taylor, there shall be a second Chancellorsville as there was a second Manassas. Lee's belief was that his able adversary, in making another thrust, would attempt, on crossing the Rapidan, to advance through the wilderness of Spotsylvania in the direction of the Richmond and Fredericksburg Railroad. He had already suggested to General Imboden in the Shenandoah Valley that he join with Mosby's Rangers in operations against the Federal Line of Communications, and he now prepared to move quickly to the northeast in order to interpose between Meade and his objective. For once the roads favored him, and he had three fair highways almost to Wilderness Run and two nearly to Chancellorsville. A heavy fog limited vision from the Confederate signal stations early on the morning of November 26, but this lifted as the day wore on and disclosed the enemy moving in force through Stevensburg towards Germanaford. As this was precisely what Lee had expected Meade to do, orders were issued for the Confederate movement to begin during the night. Care was taken to cover both flanks, and a route was selected for the wagon train that would place it where it could reach the army quickly or retire southward toward the line of the Virginia Central Railroad.
At 3 a.m. on the morning of the 27th, Lee left his headquarters near Orange Courthouse and started for Verdiersville. The weather was excessively cold, and icicles formed thickly on the beards of the officers, but Lee was in high spirits, now that there was a prospect of battle. He was quite unconscious of the inward grumbling of his staff that he had started ahead of everyone else and would arrive at his destination ere more seasonable sleepers were astir. True to these chilly predictions, when Lee reached Verdiersville he found no troops there, but down the road, in a thick pinewood, fires were burning and Confederate cavalry outposts were to be seen. After establishing his headquarters at the Rhodes house, Lee walked down the plank road and found Stuart just rising from beside the fire, where he had slept since midnight with only one blanket. What a hardy soldier! Lee exclaimed as Stuart approached. The same thing might have been said of Lee himself, for he had cast aside his cape and wore only his uniform. In a brief conversation with his chief of cavalry, Lee directed him to cover the roads in the direction of Chancellorsville and Spotsylvania Courthouse, as the enemy was believed to be moving in that direction. Not long after Stuart rode off to look for Hampton's division, which had not yet come up, General Early reported in person. Ewell's corps, Early said, was already beyond Verdiersville on the old turnpike, which approximately paralleled the plank road. Lee simply ordered him to continue his advance in the direction of Chancellorsville and to attack any force he encountered. Early rode off to direct this movement. He soon sent back word that the cavalry pickets had been driven in and that General Hayes, who was leading Early's own division, had met Federal infantry at Locust Grove, situated on a ridge about a mile and a half east of Mine Run. Assuming that this was a force thrown out to protect the rear of Federals moving eastward from the nearby fords, Lee did not ride forward to reconnoiter in person, but waited at Verdiersville for the arrival of Hill's Corps, which had a long march on the plank road from its encampments. While Early deployed his men slowly and cautiously, the morning hours passed. Shortly after noon some echoes of action may have reached Lee from the northeast, but the pine forests were thick, and sound did not carry far. Ere long, however, he must have been informed that while Johnson's division was advancing toward Bartlett's Mill, the ambulance train had been fired on from the north. Stewart's brigade had moved out from the road, the rest of the division had been recalled, and a line of battle had been formed facing the Rapidan. Meantime, Early had completed his dispositions and had put Rhodes and Hayes in line, opposite what appeared to be a strong force at Locust Grove. Instead, therefore, of having a race for Chancellorsville, with an enemy moving southeastward from the fords of the Rapidan, Lee found the Federals in his front and on his left flank. Still, the situation did not altogether contradict the view that the enemy was advancing toward Fredericksburg or the Richmond and Fredericksburg Railroad. The Federal columns might have been delayed in crossing the fords opposite Lee's front, or the forces that had been encountered by Early might be a heavy rear guard. About 1 p.m., Haight's division, at the head of Hill's Corps, reached for Deersville. Lee gave the men an hour's rest and then directed that they continue their march up the plank road toward Mine Run. Some time after the last regiment of the division had filed past, Lee himself rode forward with his staff. When he had gone about two miles he found the division halted and heard firing ahead. At length, Haight rode up and reported that when his advance had reached a point between two and three miles from Verdiersville, he had come upon a detachment of Stuart's cavalry skirmishing with Federals along the plank road. Haight had thrown forward skirmishers to support the cavalry, but they had been driven in quickly. Several attempts to drive off the enemy had been made to no purpose. Might he advance his whole division and feel out the strength of the Federals? Lee consented, and Haight hurried away. In rear of Haight's line of battle, Lee waited. North of him, where Johnson's division had been fired upon, a hot action was in progress. To the northeast, Rhodes's and Early's men were skirmishing briskly. And now Haight was about to engage. It was, to say the least, stiff and extended resistance to be offered by an adversary who was supposed to be hastening toward the railroad below Fredericksburg. General Hill, who joined Lee about this time, had been of opinion that the enemy had only cavalry in his front, but General Stewart, in a note sent at two o'clock, expressed the belief that the enemy was advancing up the Rapidan. Most significant of all was a dispatch from General Thomas L. Rosser, one of Stewart's new brigadiers. He reported that during the morning he had found the ordnance train of the I&V Army Corps on the plank road near Wilderness Tavern.
attacking, he had captured 280 mules and 150 prisoners, and, what was of far greater immediate importance, he had observed that the wagons were headed for Orange Courthouse, not for Chancellorsville. Was Meade, then, moving against the Army of Northern Virginia, rather than to the Richmond and Fredericksburg Railroad? It seemed probable, but until the purpose of the enemy was more fully disclosed, Lee hardly dared hope that his numerically inferior army would have the opportunity of fighting a defensive battle. When, therefore, Haight returned late in the evening and announced that he had driven the enemy's skirmishers from their advance position, Lee was unwilling to authorize an advance until he had personally examined the enemy's position and had seen for himself how strongly the Federals were posted. He ordered Anderson's division of Hill's corps to the right and rear of Haight to fill in the gap between Haight's left and Early's right, and after Hill returned from making these dispositions, Lee went with him on a reconnaissance. By this time he had information that the force which Johnson's division had encountered on its advance was an entire corps, part of which had been driven off, with a Confederate loss of some 545 men. Such additional intelligence as reached Lee confirmed the suspicion formed after the receipt of Rosser's dispatch and led him to conclude that the whole of the Army of the Potomac was in his front. It was not necessary to go in search of the enemy, the enemy was searching for him. For the first time, since Fredericksburg, the army was to have a chance of receiving the enemy's assaults instead of attacking. As it was now nearly dark, Lee determined not to advance against the strong position of the Federals that evening, but to withdraw to the west bank of Mine Run during the night and to await developments. Early retired behind the run without additional orders and took up a good line there. Hill's corps was recalled during the night. When Early reported, about daylight on the 28th, Lee instructed him to move his troops still farther westward to an even better defensive position, for if Meade was of a mind to assume the offensive, Lee wished to meet it on the most favorable ground. But before Early could execute this order, he found the Federal infantry advancing to Mine Run and, with Lee's permission, he waited to repulse them. A heavy rain began to fall while the army stood ready to resist attack, and this downpour seemed to deter the enemy. Making one or two minor adjustments in his front, to protect it from enfilading fire, Lee ordered earthworks thrown up. As the earth began to fly, he rode or walked among the soldiers with encouraging words. In an incredibly short time, for our men work now like beavers, one officer wrote shortly afterwards, we were strongly fortified and ready and anxious for an attack. But the enemy did not attack that day, nor the next, though he opened a heavy artillery fire on the 29th and threatened to assault. Lee could not believe that Meade had made elaborate preparations and had moved his whole army for a mere demonstration, so he continued to strengthen his earthworks while the enemy set to work to emulate him. The day witnessed the strange spectacle of two great armies exchanging occasional cannon shots and contenting themselves, for the rest, with seeing which of them could pile the higher parapets. It chanced to be a Sunday, and the weather was very cold. The men who were not on duty gathered about their fires and, here and there, assembled in prayer meetings incident to the great revival that showed no sign of losing its force. As Lee rode out on a tour of inspection, he, with his staff, chanced to pass one of these gatherings. He promptly dismounted and participated reverently in the service. On the 30th, the weather still very cold, Stuart reported early that the enemy was forming line of battle on the south side of the Catharpin Road. But once again expectations were deceived and no general engagement occurred. Puzzled as Lee was by Meade's lack of action, he was so confident of the outcome of a federal attack that he notified Davis not to reinforce him with troops that might be needed for the defense of Richmond. He continued to keep a sharp lookout on his flanks, however, especially on his right, where there had been some active cavalry skirmishing on the 29th. Sometime on the 30th a hurried message arrived from General Stewart, asking Lee to come to him at once. Lee went with the messenger and found Stewart in the company of Wade Hampton in rear of the left flank of the enemy. Hampton had reached that position unobserved and believed that it was possible to turn the federal position and repeat Jackson's movement at Chancellorsville. Lee studied the ground carefully and conferred with some of his officers, but decided against immediate action, probably because he could not bring the troops into position in time to attack that day, or else because he wished to wait a little longer in the hope that Meade would attack. When the morning of December 1 came and went with no further sign of any intention on the part of the Federals to press the offensive, Lee lost hope that the Federals would assume a vigorous offensive and he determined to take the initiative himself.
They must be attacked, they must be attacked, he said. Hill was directed to draw Anderson's and Wilcox's divisions of veterans to the extreme right, probably with an eye to moving them to the position Hampton had discovered the previous day, and Early was instructed to extend his right to cover the ground vacated by the two divisions. Lee's plan was to carry Wilcox and Anderson beyond the enemy's left flank and to sweep down it, while Early held the defenses on mine run with his own corps and with Haight's division. The weather was so cold that water froze in the canteens of the men that night, but the movement got underway smoothly and without interruption by the enemy, though there were some evidences of activity within the federal lines. Before daybreak on December 2, the whole army was ready, Anderson and Wilcox were in position, the rest of the men were on the alert, the gunners were at their posts. As soon as it was light enough to see, the skirmishers looked eagerly through the woods for the federal pickets. But they scanned the thickets in vain, the enemy was gone. The withdrawal was so unexpected that a staff officer who was sent to order Hampton's division to pursue the foe found the vedettes on the watch for an advance by the federal divisions that were then fast making their way toward the fords of the Rapidan. Informed of the changed situation, the cavalry rode fast and hard, and the infantry followed through woods the retiring enemy had set afire. Meade, however, had a long lead, for he had started during the late afternoon of the first, and the chase was fruitless. I am too old to command this army, Lee said grimly, when he saw that his adversary had retreated, we should never have permitted those people to get away. In deep depression of spirits, and indignant at the many evidences of purposeless vandalism, he soon recalled the infantry and moved back toward his camps higher up the stream. When he had cooled down, two days later, he wrote of Meade, I am greatly disappointed at his getting off with so little damage, but we do not know what is best for us. I believe a kind God has ordered all things for our good. Except for a troublesome raid by General W. W. Avril against the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, beginning December 11, the mine run episode marked the end of active operations in 1863. It had been for Lee no such year of victory as 62. The bloody glory of Chancellorsville had been dimmed by the defeat at Gettysburg. The limit of the manpower of the South had almost been reached. The specter of want hung over the camps. From the time of the return to the line of the Rappahannock and Rapidan after the Pennsylvania campaign, the army had met with no major disaster, but it had scored no success. Taking Bristow Station, the capture of the Rappahannock Bridgehead and the movement to Mine Run as one campaign, Lee's losses had been 4,255 and his gain had been nil. These casualties, amounting to nearly a whole division, were not due to recklessness on the part of the men, or to ready surrender. Aside from those killed and wounded in Johnson's division as it marched to Mine Run, virtually the whole of Lee's losses were attributable to defective leading or to carelessness on the part of commanding officers. The operations had lacked not only the dash of Jackson but the tactical skill of Longstreet, as well, and they must have raised serious misgivings in Lee's mind as to the future handling of the two corps left him. The impetuosity that had marked A. P. Hill ever since the Battle of Mechanicsville cost the army the service of two effective brigades at Bristow Station, and along with them the possibility of a substantial victory. Not since McClaws's slow bundling at Salem Church had there been a worse example of generalship. The defense at Rappahannock Bridge and at Kelly's Ford on November 7 was unskillful, even though no blame could be fixed. As for Ewell, he made no mistake at Bristow Station and was not present at Mine Run, but he was so enfeebled by his former wounds that Lee was deeply concerned for him. With his quaint language, his aquiline countenance, and his wooden leg, he was a picturesque and appealing figure as he rode gamely among the troops. Everyone was puzzled to know how he contrived to stick on his horse. Lee, however, had to ask himself the more serious question of how Ewell could sustain the hardships of an active campaign, and that question had added point, because, in Longstreet's absence, Ewell was ranking lieutenant general. If Lee went down, the command would devolve, temporarily at least, on him. Taylor probably voiced the secret feeling of his chief when he wrote, I only wish the general had good lieutenants, we miss Jackson and Longstreet terribly. The full weight of the army rested on Lee. He had to give his corps commanders a measure of direction that had been unnecessary when he had operated with two corps under Stonewall and Old Pete. His might now be the responsibility of fighting the battles as well as of shaping the strategy. It was a heavy burden to be borne by a man whose heart symptoms were becoming aggravated.
the final operations of 1863 marked two new stages in the methods of war employed by the Army of Northern Virginia. They increased, in the first place, the faith of the troops in the great utility of field fortification. Lee's construction of the South Carolina and of the Richmond Lines had early demonstrated his belief that the commanding general should provide the maximum cover for his men when they were to be engaged for a long period in defensive operations. His use of field works did not date, as some authorities have claimed, from Mine Run, but from Fredericksburg and, more particularly, from Chancellorsville. After Mine Run, as the declining strength of the army forced it more and more to the defensive, field fortification became a routine. Every soldier was a military engineer. If the infantry were finally converted to the use of earthworks at Mine Run, the cavalry developed, in the second place, an important new tactical method during the last five months of the year. Prior to the Bristow campaign, the sharpshooters of the cavalry had been organized officially and during the Second Battle of Brandy, October 11, they were dismounted by regiments and were effectively employed. In that action, Lomax's whole brigade left their horses in the rear and for a time occupied a line of breastworks. Again, in the Buckland races, Fitz Lee used some of his cavalrymen on foot. During the mine run operations, when the cavalry had to contend with a thick forest and heavy undergrowth through which it was impossible for mounted men to pass, these tactics of dismounted action were developed. In the fighting of November 27, and again on the 29th and on the 30th, the troopers were led against the enemy by regular infantry approaches. From that time onward, as the necessities of the service demanded, the dismounted cavalrymen were frequently summoned to support the thinning line of the infantry. It was hard on the troopers, but it saved horses, and it prepared the army more fully for the fearful tests that awaited in the campaign of 1864.